and welcome back, one and all, to the wonderful world of Word 2016 with your host, Dan McAllister. We're about to start Module 3, and for any of you who have actually read Winnie the Pooh books, I'm going to call this Module 3, in which Eeyore and Christopher Robin learn about tables, tabs, and styles. And we're going to need some practice files. I'm going to assume you have done that already that you have received your practice files, that you have extracted them from their zip folder. I recommend putting them out on the desktop. Uh, in earlier modules, I have also created this folder out on my desktop, finished Word documents. And so if we're always careful to finish by saving our documents to the finished Word documents, maybe we open a file from over here, work on it, and then save it as some other name or you know put them in this other folder and that way the original one is undisturbed if you want to go back and practice with them later. So I'm going to assume that we are all in that position and I'm going to go start Microsoft Word and why don't you do that with me here. As it starts up you're going to see this opening screen. You can either click on blank document or you could tap the escape key. I don't think I'd mentioned that in any of our earlier lessons. You can just tap the escape key and you have a blank document. So I'm a pretty big fan of baseball, and I'm a child of the 60s, and I grew up in the Detroit area. And about 1967, Detroit had some big riots, as many of the big cities did. And then in 1968, very much the Detroit city came back together over the Detroit Tigers, who won the World Series that year. So I'm going to pull up some dead brain cells here, some names from the past of Detroit Tigers baseball players from the 1968 winning World Series here. So I'm going to have a column, and you don't have to type this with me, you're just going to watch for a moment. So I'm going to have a column for their name, hit the space bar a couple of times, I'm going to have their, uh, their jersey number, and space bar a little bit, and then their position, like first base, second base, that kind of stuff. I'm going to hit the enter key to start a new line. So the leadoff batter for the Detroit Tigers in 1968 was a gentleman named Dick McAuliffe. Uh, his, uh, his jersey number was number three, and his position was second base. I'm going to hit the enter key. Now, any of you who are baseball fans, you will have heard of Tommy John surgery, which is a surgery that happens to many pitchers nowadays to repair an elbow tear. That was named for a pitcher named, who would have guessed, Tommy John, but the fellow that messed him up in a fight was Dick McAuliffe. Tore his arm up, and that's why he needed this surgery that had never do been done before. Otherwise, wouldn't that be a, a rare coincidence that Tommy John would be the first one to have this, the Tommy John surgery somehow? No, it's not a coincidence at, at all. Uh, so there's more information than you need to know about Dick McAuliffe. All right, Mickey Stanley was their second um, batter. Jersey number, uh, number 24. So maybe I'm trying to line that up kind of under the three there, and then a bunch of space bars. And then he played uh, left field. Actually, Mickey Stanley was the center fielder. And then the greatest Tiger of all time, Al Kaline. Uh, number six. Batting third. Uh, out in right field. Okay, now, the more I do this, the harder it becomes to get things to line up perfectly. If I turn off the pilcrows, I can see, all right, so these things aren't quite lined up just right. And uh, so I'm going to click here. I'm going to hit the backspace key, try to line up that a little bit. Uh-oh, that messed up this one. i got to try to put extra spaces in there and get that thing lined up. And, uh, and then this looks kind of funny because uh, the name McAuliffe comes way over here. And what if I get, like, a really long name that's about this long? What am I going to do trying to get that person's number in there? So there are several things that, that are not so good about using the space bar like this to line things up. So what we really want to talk about is maybe using the tab key, because the tab key lines things up on the ruler, like at a half-inch mark up here, where you don't have to hit a bunch of space and then try to eyeball things and move them around a little bit. Um, you'll just be able to move something up on the ruler and fix things. So what you saw in our intro was me working way too hard hitting space bar, space bar, space bar to try to line things up, and not doing all that great a job. It's kind of hard to get things to line up nicely that way. So what we're going to talk about next is using the tab key with things that can appear upon the ruler here called tab stops to line things up by number on the ruler rather than a whole bunch of spaces out here.
So that's what we're going to be talking about right now. Now I'd like to put a little divider line right down here that signifies I'm finished working on one idea and I'm moving on to another one. So I'm going to hit the enter key a couple of times. By the way, you have not had to like create this thing. Don't worry about that. So I've hit the enter key a couple of times and then I'm going to hit the up arrow key one time. And I'd like to put a little divider line across here. And I'm going to do that by going to the home tab and noticing this button right here called borders. And when I click on the sneaky list arrow, Next to the borders button, I will see a pull down list of different kinds of borders that I can use. And as I hover over one, you should actually be able to see what it looks like down here with that cool live preview thing. So I just want to put a bottom border down there. So I click on bottom border and then I click to put my cursor below there. By the way, did you notice how I hit enter twice and then came back up once? If I didn't do that, I'd have the border below what I was typing and then I would actually have kind of a problem getting it down below that line. I guess one of the ways around that would have been that I could have used a, a top border for the line I was on. Anyway, I digress. So I want to start building this table again, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, the word table actually means something kind of special here, but I'll call it that so far. So I'm going to start it with the word name again. But this time what I want to do is use a tab key on my keyboard. And one of the things you'll see right now, every time I hit the tab key, it moves my flashing cursor under the next available half inch or full inch markup on the ruler. So right now I'm lined up with the half inch mark. And then I'm going to hit the tab key again. And it jumps over to the one inch mark. And I hit the tab key again, it jumps to the one and a half inch mark. And in fact, if I go up and turn on the pilcrows again, I'll actually see dots for every place I've hit the space bar and little arrows for every place I've hit the tab key. So just at a glance, you can kind of see I'm working less hard using the tab key than space, 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 space. And to take them out, I just hit the backspace key, moves my cursor backwards, and right now it's lined up under that half inch mark, and that'll be okay for the moment. So I'm going to turn the pilcrows off. All right, I'd like you to do that much so far. Type in the word name, hit the tab key, watch it line up under the half inch mark. So pause the video and then come on back. All right, picking up there, I want to put in the word number as my column header. So having typed the word number, I'm now going to hit the tab key again and it lines up for the next half inch mark there. And I'm going to put in the word position. And then when I hit the enter key, it jumps on down there and starts a new line. All right, so now I'm typing in McAuliffe. Then I hit the tab key. Oh, that jumped over there quite a ways because it went to the next half inch mark there. Or I'm going to fill in that he was number three. And I'm going to hit the tab key and it jumps over here and I'm going to fill in that he was there at second base. Okay, well, let's see. At first it looks like, well, it looked better the other way than this way, but hang in there with me. So I'm going to uh, show the pilcrows, that is, I'm going to be showing the tab, st uh, the tab markers down here. That little arrow, remember, is every place I've hit a tab key. What I would like to do is line things up so that this column will be centered under a spot up on my ruler, and this column will have its right edge aligned up on the ruler. But I'm going to make a little mistake as I do this. So why don't you put the video on pause, do what you saw me do, I was at the end of the word position, I hit the enter key, type in this guy's name, hit the tab key once, type in his number, number three, I know it doesn't line up very well yet, hit the tab key once, type in the 2B. All right, so catch up with me, and then we'll pick up from there. All right, so wouldn't it be nice if I could override the default that says that it just jumps to the next half inch mark every time I hit the tab key? And also, I don't want it to necessarily line up the left edge of every column when I hit the tab key. So I would like to draw your attention to this thing right up in the upper left corner where the two rulers meet. Looks like a little letter L, and when I go hover over it with my mouse, I see this tooltip that says left tab. Right now, watch what happens if I click on that little L, and then I move away from it. Kind of looks like an upside down letter T, and when I hover over it now, it says center tab. By the way, you do have to move away from it and then hover over it again for it to tell you the new name. 
So here's what I want to do. I want to have the second column here, this tab key, to line up the center of the word number at about the one inch mark. So with that upside down T, because I've clicked on it enough to get there, don't click on it again, otherwise you'll have to keep clicking it about eight times to get it to cycle around to the T again. So while you've got the T up there, I'm, while I've got the T up there, I'm gonna go up here and click at, oh, how about the one inch mark I said I was gonna do? Actually, I should do it better. I should go to about the one and a half inch mark. Notice how it lined up that three now at that one and a half inch mark. But what about the word number? It didn't line up over there. That's because the tab stops only work for one paragraph at a time. So if I want to adjust the tab spot for more than one paragraph, I need to select at least part of more than one paragraph. So the first thing I'm going to do is undo that. Notice that removed that little upside down T there. And what I'm going to do instead is choose part of each of these two paragraphs. I don't actually have to choose the whole thing. I don't necessarily have to move out here and select the two lines that way. I just have to have part of this paragraph and part of that paragraph selected. And now I'm going to go up there and place that T at the one and a half inch mark. See how it modified both of those. So the first tab key goes to the first tab stop. And I adjusted both lines because I had part of both lines. I shouldn't say lines, I should say paragraphs. Selected. I'm going to do one more and then you're going to put the video on pause and catch up with me. I want to line up the right edge of the position column here. And that means I need to figure out how to put a right aligned tab stop at the about the two and a half inch mark. So I'm going to do that right over here. I'm going to go click on that upside down T and move away from it. It looks like a backwards L. And when I go hover on it, it tells me that is a right tab. It would line up the right edge of columns. So with these parts of these two paragraphs selected, I've got my backwards L. I'm going to go put that right at the uh, two and a half inch mark. And it lines up the right edge of that column. And I'm going to turn off the pill crows. And things are looking okay that way. And when I hit the enter key, I'm going to put in that next player, Mickey Stanley. Tab key. Ooh, it lined up right centered under the word number. And Mickey Stanley's number was, yeah, you can see it on screen there, 24. Centers that nicely. Hit the tab key. It lines up the right edge of my next column. And it will actually type backwards as I type in the CF. All right, so what did I do there? Well, I clicked this guy enough times to get the upside down T and put that one at the one and a half inch mark. By the way, remember before I did that, I had to select multiple paragraphs here. Just to be safe, why don't you do it out in the margin? And then go up and place that upside down T centered tab stop at the one and a half inch mark. Click that thing again, get the backwards L, move away, hover over it, make sure it says right tab, place that one at the two and a half inch mark. And then add Mickey Stanley, I misspelled his name here, Mickey Stan Lee with an E, not the Spider-Man guy. Uh, and uh, hit the tab key, it'll line up his number as you type it. Hit the tab key, it'll line up center field, and it'll even type it backwards from that spot. All right, your turn to set up those tab stops up on the ruler and make use of them with one tab stop equaling one tab key. Put the video on pause. Okay, I hope things are going well for you, and I hope you're having a little bit of geeky fun as well. So, let us uh, hit the enter key. We'll start a new line. And how about if we put another border in there? Well, this time I'm going to show you kind of a cool way to put in a border. This is just going to be a keyboard shortcut that's built in by default in every copy of Microsoft Word. Rather than going up to the little border button this time, I'm going to type three minus signs in a row. Minus sign, minus sign, minus sign. And watch what happens when I hit the enter key. Boink! Little border across there. By the way, if I do it with uh, equal signs, I'll get a little double line border across there. So try that out. You're right at the end of uh, center field. Tap the enter key. Give it at least three hyphens. You can type more if you want, but you're just working too hard. So minus, 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 hit the enter key. You'll get the nice little border across there. So you don't have to put the video on pause. Just go to the next section right now. In that last module, we saw how we could set up tab stops by placing them on the ruler. Now, having hit the Enter key to start a new paragraph, it assumes that I want those same tab stops. But what if I need to put together another kind of tab table 
where I want the cursor to stop in different places than these. Well, one of the ways I could do that would be to grab these individual tab stops and drag them down off the ruler and then place in the new ones. But I don't actually have to do that. I'm going to show you a way to do this through one of the menu choices, and it will have a couple of advantages. It will have at least one new superpower, and I'll be avoiding having to take the old tab stops down off the ruler. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of ways to get there. One of them is one click longer than the other. So to get to the tab stops, man, it's in a place you would never guess. I'm going to point at this button right here. It says line and paragraph spacing. Yeah, I would think of that for tab stops. Uh, not really, but I'm going to click on it anyway. And then I see a little pull down arrow here, a little pull down list. And it's got stuff about adding space before the paragraphs, line spacing options. What does this have to do with any tabs? But if, in fact, I click on line spacing options, okay, well, we've seen this window before. We were indenting left and right sides of paragraphs, align the paragraph to the left or the right or centered or justified to line up both the left and the right side, indent the left side, indent the right side. We didn't really talk about any line spacing, at least we didn't talk about very much of it, line spacing inside the paragraph, other than I guess I did a double space thing here. Anybody see anything about tabs? Yeah, it's pretty subtle. It's way down there. And then when I go down there and click on tabs, now I'm into this new window about tab stops. So let me show you how I did that again. I went to, I had to be under the home command tab here first. Went over here to line spacing options, down here to the line spacing options dialog window, and then down here to tab. So that took me three clicks to get to that spot. Here is a slightly faster way. So I start under the home tab. This time I'm going to use that dialog launcher. I click on that. Now I'm one click into it. Second click, I'm into the tab. So one click quicker. Yeah, I know, big deal. But I'll keep trying to throw those things in there. All right, so now to set this thing up, what I want to do is put together, we've all seen, uh, like you walk into a restaurant and they've got their menu, and on the left side it has the name of the uh, item, and then you'll see like little dots leading your eye across to the price. Um, those are called leader lines. There's not really a nice way to set leader lines for tab stops when you're just doing stuff up on the ruler. But if we go into that dialog window I just showed you, then we will be able to play with this a little bit. So I'm going to go, I have to be in the home ribbon. Then I'm going to go click on that little dialog launcher right there. And I'm going to slide down here and click on tabs. And one of the things you'll see here is any of those tab stops that I never erased, that I never dragged down off the ruler, they are being mentioned right over here. And if you'll notice this little spot, remember how I was telling you that the default setting was every time you hit the tab key, it jumps to the next half inch mark? This is why, because of the way it's set up right in this window. Also notice, I have the choice here to line up the left side, the center of a column, the right side of a column. And then right down here below there is something called leader lines. And there was no way to do that with the stuff on the ruler. So I'd like you to go that far with me. Let me remind you, we went to the Home tab. In the Paragraphs group, we clicked on the Dialog Launcher. Where did we go next? Yep, down here to tabs, and that takes you to this window. So put the video on pause, join me there, and then we will set ourselves up some cool tab stops. All right, first thing I'd like to do is select one and clear it, or maybe even better, there's a nice little button right here, to clear all tab stops for this paragraph that I'm in right now. I can see there's still one up here on the ruler at about two and a half inch mark. It's mentioned right there. It has the backwards L, which was right aligned. It mentions that right there. And we haven't talked about leader lines, so that's a none. So let's click on Clear All. Just switch back to your screen for a moment. Clear All. I'll wait for you to get back. Okay. So what I want to set up here is I'm going to type the name of a product right here at the left margin. And then when I hit the Tab key, I want it to jump over to about the 2-inch mark with a set of dots that leads the eye across there. That's called the leader line. And then I'll put in the price of the object, and then when I hit the tab key, it's gonna jump over to another column, and I'll put in the price of an object, and then when I hit tab, it'll jump over to about the five inch mark with maybe a different style leader line, just so we can see what they look like. So that's what we're gonna set up right now. 
So one of the things you have to remember to do is type stuff here and then hit the set button. And whatever number you had typed up here will appear down there, and then what's up here will be already selected, and you can type right over top of it. You'll see me do it right now. Um, so I've just cleared all. So I'm going to start with the name of the product right here, and then when I hit the tab key, I want it to jump to the 2-inch mark, and I want it to line up the right-hand side of that column. So first thing I'm going to type right up here is a 2. It will assume that I need inches. I don't have to type the little quote mark for inches. Uh, so I'm typing in a 2. I want it to line up the right-hand side of that column, so I'm going to make it a right-aligned tab stop. And I want it to have a number 2 style leader line, which would be a bunch of little periods. Notice a number 3 style would be a bunch of hyphens. Number 4 style would be a series of underscores. So we're going to go with the number 2 style leader line. And then before I go up and type another number, I have to remember to set that one. I click the set button. Now it says right in here, two inches. And that one's right aligned and it's gonna have the leader line leading up to it that are gonna be a bunch of dots. All right, so your turn. You have clicked on clear all. If you haven't, do that already. Go up here to the tab stop position, type in a two. You don't have to type the inch mark. Set it to be right aligned with a number two style leader line. Click the set button. You and I will be in the right place. So put the video on pause, do that. Okay, when I type that thing at the two inch mark, it will back up my numbers because it's lining up the right edge of that column. When I hit the tab key again, I want it to line up the left edge of a new column at the three inch mark. So my job right now, notice how the two inches that I was typing already is um, highlighted, waiting for me to type a new number, which will be three. I'm going to make it left aligned but I just want blank space in between. I don't want a leader line there, so I'm gonna leave that as none. So having put in a two inch right align, tab stop with a number two leader line, my next one here is at the three inch mark, left align, no leader line, and before I move on, I must click set. And then one more, we're gonna type in, let's see, so I'll have about an inch to type stuff, so how about at the four and a half inch mark next, 4.5 inch mark, a right aligned tab stop with a number, how about a number three style leader line, and set that. So you're going to put the video on pause here. You're going to make a three inch uh, left aligned tab stop with no leader line, set it. You're going to make a four and a half inch right aligned tab stop with a number three style leader line, set that. Come on back after you do that. All right, assuming you have done that, click on the OK button. So I see a marker up here, a backwards L at the two inch mark. That's my right align tab stop. Left line tab stop at the three inch mark. Right align tab stop at the four and a half inch mark. Now I start typing in my products. Any of you who have ever taken a marketing class, they're always selling this one project. Uh, starts with a W, talking about widgets. So I'm gonna be selling my widgets. And then here comes the magic thing when I hit the tab key. Point, there's my leader line. And that's actually going to print. That's not the Pilcro thing that's showing me a bunch of dots. That's the actual leader lines. And now I'm going to put in the price of the widgets. They're going to be um, a nickel 98. And notice how it backed up that typing because it's lining up the right edge of that column. When I hit the tab key, it jumps to the three inch mark. No little dots in there because we said that one wouldn't have leader lines. And then these are going to be my gadgets. I hit the tab key, jumps over to that th th four and a half inch mark, different style leader line this time. I wouldn't do that in real life. I would use the same one in both places, but I got to uh, show you two birds, one stone that way. And the price of the gadgets are uh, $3.25. When you hit the enter key, you're ready to do a new line. Feel free to make up a product, put it in there, hit the tab key, make another product and put it in there and so forth. Just play with that for a minute. So this is tab stops with leader lines, and there's not really a way to do that by using the ruler. You really needed to go to the tabs window, and that reminds you one last time of a quick way to do that. We went to the uh, dialog launcher here for paragraph settings, went to the tabs, and then we put stuff in here about how we wanted those to go. All right, catch up with me, go play with those things.
Hope you're having some geeky fun by now. All right, we're going to switch gears here in a minute. We're going to start talking about tables, which is another way to line up rows and columns, but usually it has borders. It has boxes around the, uh, the individual pieces that in Excel you would call cells. So that's what we'll be doing in our next setup here. I'd like to give everybody a little bit of practice right now with some of the things that we've seen. It'll just be a quick one. It will involve things up here on the ruler and some tab stops. So I would like us all to go open a file named Learning Tabs 2. So I'm headed there right now. I'm headed to my file menu. I'm going to open a file. I'm going to browse over here. I'm going to head to my uh, Word Sample Files folder. Again, I'm looking for one named Learning Tabs 2. It's going to come up looking like this, and you can see things are not wonderful here. Now, at first, you might not see the little arrows there. You'll only see those if you turn on the pilcrows. And what do the little arrows mean? Hopefully you're saying that's where the tab keys have been hit. Little teeny little arrows there, but they're there. So things are not wonderful here. First column is great. There's no tab stop in front of it. It's just lined up at the margin. Second column's looking pretty good. Third column is awful. So you could line up the left edge of that third column or the right edge of that third column. You're going to need to line it up over here someplace so that these longer uh, course names don't mess up things that are happening here right now. Right now it's going at that every half inch uh, tab stop thing. So your job is to fix that third column so that those numbers line up better somehow over here. You decide how far over they have to be. You can even eyeball them. But the job is you got to put something up here in the, uh, in the ruler to override those all half-inch tab stops. So take just a moment and do that. A little bit of practice. All right, this time I'm going to catch up with you. So this would be a mistake, and maybe you made this mistake as you were practicing, and I'll bet you caught it after you did it. I want a tab stop up here on the ruler. But if I put a tab stop up there right now, like a right-aligned tab stop, and I put that at, say, the three inch mark. Notice how number one, that moves that very first line because the first tab key is now going to that first tab stop and it's lining up the right edge of that column. All right, so that's one mistake that you might have made. So um, let's see how I might get around that. First, I'm going to use uh, undo to get around that, take that back. And then what I might want to do is put a uh, tab stop up here at the one inch mark as a left aligned tab so that the first tab key will go to that first tab stop there. But you saw just a moment ago, it only affected this first line. So that in itself was a mistake. I really should be able to choosing all of these paragraphs before I do any of that. Now I've got to go over here and try to cycle this around to be an L again. And so I have to click, click, click. Sometimes you have to click and kind of move away from it to be able to see it better. So I'm clicking on it. Let's see, one, I've, I've got a right align tab stop. So that was my first click. Second click, I got something called a bar tab. Wait, you can run a bar tab here in Word? I am clicking, clicking, clicking. And when I get to the left aligned one, the original L, I'm going to stop. And I actually went past it. So got to click on it, move away a little bit, click on it. There's my left aligned L. And with the left aligned L and all of these paragraphs selected, I'll click on the one inch mark. So that one can be a bit of a trick, and we hadn't talked about it before, so it might have hung you up for a minute there. And then the other thing I want to do is maybe I'll line up the right-hand sides of that third column. So the first column doesn't need a tab stop. It's at the margin. So the first tab key went to the first tab stop. Now I'm going to have another tab stop over here. Maybe I'll right align the right edge at uh, three inches. So i got to click it enough times to get the backwards L, the right align tab stop marker, and I'm going to put that right on my three-inch mark. And while I have all those paragraphs selected, things are looking better. All right, so that, that one had a little bit of a curveball in it, but hopefully you worked it out. All right, I'm going to switch gears right here. We're going to be talking about how you can enter something called a table. And tables are kind of cool because they look like Excel spreadsheets, sort of. They have border boxes around the individual cells. And one of the ways to do that is to actually start with this thing, this thing called a tabbed table. And then there's a way to convert this to what's called a word table. So while you, we've been playing with this, by the way, if 
that totally stumped you and now you know how to do it, again, put the video on pause and do what you saw me do. The trick was we had about three tricks. You had to select all of the paragraphs, not necessarily this first one, although it wouldn't hurt the first one. It doesn't have any tab keys in it, so it would just be unaffected, basically. So you selected all the paragraphs you wanted to work on, give it a left aligned tab stop at the one inch mark, right aligned tab stop at the three inch mark, and your screen will look like mine. So if you haven't figured that out already, I do that right now. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how you can take this tabbed table and turn it into a word table. And to do this, I'm gonna go up here to the insert tab, and I see a choice about table. And one of the ways to insert a table is to highlight things, but right now that's kind of grayed out because I've got something selected that's already a tab table. But notice there is a choice down here about convert text to a table. That's kind of hard to read on my screen when it's miniaturized on your screen, so you'll have to go hover over that and it'll tell you how to split a single column of text into multiple columns. For example, separate a column of full names into a separate first name and last name. Well, it also says you'll be able to choose how you want it split, but really what I want to do is just slide down there and click on Convert Text to Table. Opens up this little dialog window. And it's trying to count how many columns wide this thing should be based on the number of tab stops in there. And then either I can say Fix Column Width, which will actually make all three columns the same size, the same width, and go from margin to margin. There's also a couple other choices down there about auto fit to the contents. That will look at the average widths of each of those columns and try to make the cells not necessarily the same size as each other, but a little wider cell for longer words and a little shorter cell for shorter words. And also notice down here, it's trying to figure out what should it use as the, what's sometimes called the delimiter. What's the character that should signify a new column? And it has suggested that it's the tab key, and that is exactly true. So all I'm going to do right now is click on OK, and I have a table. All right, it leaves a little bit to be desired, but we'll keep talking about things. So join me. You've got those cells selected. We went up there to Insert, Table, Convert Text to Table. Clicked on OK. You should get what you see here. And because I've got the Pilcros on, I've got some end of uh, cell markers in there. I'll turn those off. I'll click on the uh, Pilcros to turn that off. All right, so take it from there. You've got it all selected. You're going to insert, text to table, click OK. You will get this thing. All right, I'd like to compare that now to one of the other choices. So thank goodness sometimes for undo. Give it that Control Z to undo. And then let's try that again with just a slight different twist on the end of it. So I'm going to start it the same way. I've got my tabbed table selected. Go into the Insert tab, I'm going to click on Table, I'm going to Convert Text to Table, and this time let's try Auto Fit to Contents. Same delimiter, Tab key, clicking on OK. That one's a little bit nicer. So your turn to try that. Yeah, undo what you did on that uh, great big table that you were getting out of that thing, and just start the same way. You've got the tab stuff selected, Insert, Text to Table. And don't go with the fixed width, go with the um, auto fit, I think it was called. All right, put the video on pause, join me there. In our next session, we're gonna see that you don't have to start with a bunch of tab stuff just to make a table. We'll go about it this other way. We'll go to insert and then we'll go to table and then we'll paint a range of cells and that'll be a new way to build a table without starting with a bunch of tab stops first. So this is the end of this particular part of the module. You can, if you want, use the Save As command and take this file that we started with and save it over to the Finished Documents folder. I'm going to do that right now. I'm not going to click the Save button. That would destroy the original. So instead, I'm going to go to File and Save As. Maybe I'll keep the same name, but instead of putting it back in the Word Sample Files folder, I'm going to put it in my Finished Documents folder that's out on my desktop. I have a little shortcut for it over here. We learned how to do that in an earlier module. Otherwise, go to Desktop, and then on the right-hand side, go to your finished Word documents. You can keep the same name. You're not overwriting the original. The original is back in there in the uh, practice files. 
So I'm going to finish saving that new thing there. And you'll probably get this uh, information window that says you're taking a file that was created in 2003 format and updating it to the newer file format, and we'll just hit Enter or click on OK. I'm going to recommend that you take a moment and close all of the Word documents that we've been working on. You've probably got about three of them open. So close them, up to you whether you want to save them. And then we are going to create a next table from scratch here. We are not going to start with a tab document. All right, I'm assuming you have done that. So time to start talking about creating a table from scratch. And this is going to be about maybe a hotel. And we're doing some advertising for our hotel. We're going to advertise the different kinds of rooms that we have. And the prices change during different seasons of the year. And we've got rooms with an ocean view and rooms that don't have an ocean view. So we're going to start out by building a table from scratch. And then we're going to modify it. We're going to add new rows to it. And see all kinds of different things that we can do with tables that didn't start with tab stops. So here we go. Of course, you're going to watch and then you'll join me. So we're not going to open a file here. We're just starting one from scratch. I'm going to go up to the Insert tab, and I'm going to click on Table. And I'm going to start with a three row by three column table. So I'm not holding any mouse button. I'm just rolling across these little boxes. And as I do that, I see a live preview of what I'm creating. And also, you'll probably see it like with some numbers up here. 2 by 3, 3 by 5, 4 by 6. I'm going to start out with a 3 by 3. And then when I see it the way I like it, I'm just clicking on it. And there comes my 3 by 3 table. So take a moment. Do that. It'll only take you a second. So you closed things. And now on a brand new document, you've gone to the Insert tab. And you've inserted a 3 by 3 table. Okay, assuming that you have done that, we're now going to start filling stuff in here. So we're going to start out by um, putting in some labels for the top row, like uh, the season. And I can either hit the right arrow key, or I'm more in the habit of hitting the tab key to go to the next cell. And so we're going to be talking about, um, let's see, what kind of rooms we have. So season and room... And then I'm hitting the tab key and we'll add the word view. So notice that when I'm in the last cell in a row, if I hit the tab key one more time, it assumes that I wanted to go to the first column of the next row. And very often that's true, so that's pretty handy. So catch up with me there. The season, the room, the view, hit the tab key, you're in the second row. I'll give you a second to do that. Okay, so our first season is going to go from, say, January through April. And then I'm going to hit the tab key, and our first type of room is the King Suite. And then I'm going to hit the down arrow key, and the next kind of room is going to be our two queen bed suite, two queens. I got three jacks and two queens, full house there. All right, um, now I'd like to hit the down arrow key, but if I do that right now, it jumps out of my table. So I'm hitting the up arrow key to go back in there. I would like to insert a new row, and one of the ways to do that is up here in the ribbon. So while you're in a table, you'll have a couple of tools up here. You'll see a thing that says Table Tools, and under there, one of them says Design, and one of them says Layout. And if you go to the Layout tab, you'll see some stuff over here about rows and columns including insert a row below, or insert a column to the left, or a column to the right, or a row above. A row above what? Well, wherever your cursor is flashing there. So I would like to insert a row below so that I could put in a third kind of a room here. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go click on Insert Below. Watch out below. And then I'm going to click right below two queens, and the third kind of rooms we have are the ones with the two double beds. So two double. All right, take a moment and catch up with me. So all I did was type in the labels up there at the top, January through April, King Suite, down arrow key, two queens, couldn't hit the down arrow key, I'd jump out of the table, but I was able to insert below and then fill in the two double as the room. So do that much. All right, so we're gonna talk about how we can put cells together and how we can split them apart. So one of the things I'd like to talk about right now is split cells. So first thing I want to do is make this whole table a bit taller. And as long as I've got a cursor flashing anywhere in it, I'll see this little box over here in the bottom right corner. 
I'm going to use the control and scroll wheel to zoom way out, maybe even more than that, so I can pretty much see the whole page. I'm going to grab that little box and drag pretty much straight down as best I can. And when I let go, boy, all my cells got bigger. That may be overkill for what we need, or, you know, we can adjust it back later. So take just a moment and do that. You've got your cursor anywhere in that table. Go grab that bottom box and drag it down till this thing is just pretty much huge. Okay, we're going to pick it up from there. So what I'd like to do now is split the view cell into two cells so that I can have one, excuse me, I don't want to split the label for the view. I want to deal with the next row down there. So watch me make this top row shorter. I'm going to touch the border of the bottom of that first row. As I do that, see, I can't show it to you zoomed in. As I do that, I get a two-headed arrow, and I can grab that line and drag it up here so it's a bit shorter. And the whole table gets shorter, but the other three rows stay nice and big. So take just a second and do that. Grab that uh, bottom of the labels row and drag it up till they're a little bit smaller, and then these will still be big. So the next thing I would like to do is turn this one cell into two cells. And one of the ways to do that is through a command up here called split cells. The only problem is if I select this cell and tell it to split it into two, it will actually make another one that's exactly as tall as this one is already. And I don't really want to do that. So instead, I'm going to introduce you to the drawing tools for a table over here. So I'm going to start out with a little pencil tool. It says draw table. So I'm going to click on that, and then I'm going to start with my little pencil marker here, and I'm going to touch it kind of in the middle of the side, and I'm going to drag straight across there. And when I let go, I have just split that one cell into two. And I've still got the pencil in my hand. I'm going to do that right down here as well. Now I'm trying to get it perfectly divided, but don't worry if you don't quite get it there. There's a way to fix it. So you're going to grab your pencil tool, drag across here to split those cells, and then get rid of the pencil tool, turn it off. It's kind of kind of dangerous sometimes. All right, so you're going to go do that over here in the draw tools. Click on draw table and draw a line across there, a line across there, a line across there. And then we'll see how to equally distribute those cells. So grab your pencils, everybody, your number two pencils, and split those cells by drawing dividers. Put the video on pause. Go do that. We're going to pick up right after that. All right, so now to make these cells the same size as each other, actually I think the first thing I'd like to do is uh, make the table shorter now. So I'm going to drag upward and make those rows shorter. They're still not all the same size as each other, but I did make them shorter. And I think I'd like to make them kind of about like this. And, and don't worry that you don't have it exactly right. Uh, so grab that bottom corner and drag it up. Actually, don't do that yet. Just watch me for another minute. So I have grabbed that bottom corner and dragged it up. And now I'm going to select these cells. I'm ignoring the label at the top. I'm going to the first cell below there. And I'm going to select these cells right here. And then the button I'm looking for is up here in the uh, cell size box. And if I hover over that guy right there, it won't show up while I'm zoomed in like this. But if you hover over that, you'll see it says Distribute Rows. And so with these, um, these cells selected, I'm going to click on the Distribute Rows. And when I click away, I should nicely see that they are now evenly distributed. They each have the same height as each other. That's why I wasn't too worried about exactly where I was drawing those lines. All right, so your turn to do that. You've got the lines drawn in there. Make the thing shorter again. Select those six cells and distribute them evenly. All right, everybody. All right, everyone, let's make this whole thing skinnier. So we're going to grab this bottom right corner. You're going to drag it in a little bit. Let's also make it shorter. So I'm making it about like that. What I want to do is leave some room to add another column out here. So make that thing shorter and skinnier. Let's see, right now I've got it about four inches wide and, according to the ruler, about two inches tall. So grab that bottom right corner, resize that thing. Um, in fact, watch me for one more second. So I've made it shorter and skinnier, and I've done that because I want to add another column out here. So click anywhere in that last column. You don't have to select all of them or anything. 
Click anywhere in that last column and then up here under the layout tab, tell it you want to insert a column to the right. Insert right, there it comes. This will be where we put the prices eventually. So make it shorter and skinnier, leave yourself some room, otherwise the new column is going to go off the page. And then click anywhere in that last column and insert to the right, please. All right, let's pick it up from there. I'm using control and the scroll wheel to zoom in. And we're going to have, um, for the King Suite, there's one price. If you go with the expensive side of the motel where you've got the ocean view, and then there'll be a different price when you're on the other side of the motel looking at all the people walking by on the sidewalk, the non-ocean view. And then essentially what I want to do is copy those two cells down to the rest of the column here. So I'm going to select those two. I'm going to make a copy. And I'm going to click in the next cell down and I'm going to paste, maybe using control V. Next cell down, paste again with control V. All right, so what did we just do? Well, we made the thing skinnier. We inserted a column at the right. We have typed in ocean view, non-ocean view. We copied, we pasted, we pasted. So I'm going to end this video session at this point. Um, we'll come back and we'll pick up there. You don't have to put the video on pause. It'll just automatically go to the next one here. So make sure you've caught up with that part. And let's go on to the next section, everybody. Hope you're having a good time. More importantly, hoping you're thinking how you might use this and the kind of stuff that you're going to do in Microsoft Word. Well, just at the end of the last session, we had added this new column here. Let's go up and put a label in there that says price. And then I'd like to put a title at the top of this table. So I need to insert a new row above the top row of this table. Well, if we look up here at our layout uh, ribbon, there are choices about insert right and insert below. And then there's this one about insert above. I'm going to go click on that, insert above. Hey, there comes a new row. And I want to put a title in there, but I want the title to span all the way across that top row. You may have seen the merge and center button in Excel. Here in Word, you have to do it in two steps. So I have the four cells selected. I'm going to go up to this button right here that says merge those cells. So I'm clicking on that. All the little borders disappear. This is now one big cell. When I click in it, my cursor is way over at the left-hand side. I would like that cursor to center itself in the cell. And there's a couple of ways to do that. Here's a nice one. So under the Layout tab here, I have different ways that I could make the text look in the cell. So I could have the text be at the left edge and either the top of the cell, the middle of the cell, the bottom of the cell. Or I could have the text in the middle of the cell, centered left to right, in the top of the cell, the middle of the cell, the bottom of the cell. You get the idea here. So in this case, what I would like to do is have these words right in the middle of that big cell right there. And why don't we put it not only centered left to right, but also top to bottom. Right now, there won't be much of a difference top to bottom because it's not very tall, but Let's go with that choice right there. So what I have done uh, over the last couple of seconds was insert a row above, and then with all those cells selected, I merged them. And now I would like us to click on this little button right here to put your cursor right in the middle of that cell. And then you're going to type in the name of our new motel here. And it was CD Shores Motel. Sounds like a great place, doesn't it? All right, so catch up with me. You've got the insert above, you've got the merge, now you've got the center, uh, top, bottom, left, and right, and then the new title, the CD Shores Motel. Welcome to CD Shores, everybody. So that's one way to merge cells together. We selected them and then merge them, uh, you know, left and right. What I want to do next is merge these three cells, but I'd like to show you a new way to do it, a slightly different way. And this time, I'm going to use the drawing tools again, only instead of drawing lines, I'm going to erase lines. So I'm going to go up and click on Table Eraser. And then the bottom corner of that little eraser is the working part. So I'm going to put the bottom corner of that right on this line, and when I click on it, it erases it. And then I'm going to go do the same thing to this line. It erases it. 
and I have essentially merged those three cells. And then what I want to do is have the text centered top to bottom, but at the left side of the cell. So first thing I need to do is get rid of the eraser. And then you're going to go over here into the layout part and find the button that will let the text be at the left side, but centered top to bottom. It's this one. So catch up with me there. You're using your eraser to erase the divider lines and merge the cell, and then get the text to be over there, left aligned, but centered top to bottom. That video on pause, catch up with me. All right, here comes some fun stuff. I'm changing my mind. I would like this centered left to right and top to bottom, and you'll see why in just a second. So switch buttons here for the layout. Centered left to right and top to bottom, the one right in the middle of those nine cells there, or those nine buttons. And then I draw your attention to the button just to the right of that, text direction. Turns out there are only three settings in this, and they will just cycle through the three settings as you click. So I click on it once. There, it turned my text sideways. I click on it again, it turned my text sideways, but flipped it over. And then I click on it again, and it puts it back in there left to right. So I would like the text to look like this. January through April with January in the bottom, April on the top. So we centered it left to right and top to bottom. Then we went with the text direction. Click on it enough times to get it to look like this. And you're good to go. All right, we're kind of coming down the home stretch here. I want to zoom out now. And we have two other seasons. One of them goes from May to September. And the third one goes from October to December but all of them are laid out the same way. So what I want to do is copy everything, not including the merged and centered top row, not including the labels that say season and room, but all those other cells right there. I want to drag across them to select them. Then I'm going to make a copy of them through whatever's your favorite method. I'm going to use control C. I'm going to click down here in the bottom right corner, and I recommend insert a new row below there, but if you try to do that with the insert below, you can get some problems when you have merged cells like this. So I'm going to use this little trick that I think I showed you before. I'm hitting the tab key and it makes a new row down there. And now I'm going to go select all these cells and make a copy of them. And then I'm going to click in the cell down below and then I'm going to paste in there. I can use control V. I can right click. If I right click, I have to choose which version of paste that I like. So some of them are better than others. I'm actually just going to recommend in this case, use control V. It does a nice job of pasting that stuff in there. Now one odd little thing, notice it didn't keep the merging. So now I've got to go in and merge these cells. So I'm going to go select them. I'm going to go back up to my Layout tab under the uh, Design Tools there, under the Table Tools. I'm going to merge those cells. Ah, that looks better. And then your job is to do that one more time. Click in the bottom cell there, Tab key, Select and Copy, and then Control v in the cell down below. So this time I'm copying with Control c clicking down here in the cell below, paste with Control v and then Merge and Center. So you're almost there. The last thing to do will be to change these two seasons here. So the second season goes from uh, May through September, and the third one goes from October through December. All right, everybody, finish that off. All right, one last little piece here. I want to make it a little more obvious that these cells are one piece, and these cells are another piece, and these cells are another piece. Well, there's several ways to do it, but I like to do it by putting in cell shading, it's called. So I'm going to select these cells right here, dragging across there. And then under the Design tab, there's a button here about shading. I click the little pull-down arrow under Shading, and I'm going to choose kind of a light color there, because i got dark text in it. If I try to get like really dark colors in there, then it becomes hard to read the text. So let's see, uh, January through April, um, let's see, maybe that's kind of my green season. So I'm going to go with a light green fill for that one. 
Then I'm going to go select this next range of cells. This is my hotter than July, or as hot as July, or as hot as May to September anyway. So I'm going to go with maybe some light red in there, kind of a pink fill. And then October through uh, December, boy, that's cold. So I'm going to go with some cold blue fill, blue shading. So it's your turn now. You select cells, you go to the shading. Select cells, go to the shading. Select cells, go to the shading. Catch up with me there. So I see there's one more thing we need to work on here. When we copied and pasted, it did not keep the merged cells. I've got dividers here where I don't want them. So my favorite way to do that is to use the eraser. So I'm going to click on my eraser, and I'm going to erase on that eraser. Now I've got it in my hand, so I'm erasing that line to merge those two together. Same thing here, same thing here. Got a couple more places to do that. And then get rid of the eraser, turn it off. And then we will select these cells because I would like their words to be aligned to the left but centered in the big cells. Right now they're aligned to the left and the top of the cells. So I want this button right here to align them to the left but center them top to bottom in their cells. That guy right there. So now we've done our not necessarily merge and center left and right but merge and center top to bottom. And then one more piece we might want to format is this top cell right here. Why don't we fill that with a, a nice uh, color of some sort? So I'm going back to my uh, design tab, and I'm going to do the shading, and I'm going to pick some color there that I haven't used already. All right, everybody, finish that off. Get the little dividers here looking good, and, uh, and put some color behind the title up there. So I hope everybody's had some fun working with building tables. When we come back for our next session, we're going to talk about I've got tables that I need to sort, or maybe I need to do some calculations in a table. So we'll see you in the next session, everybody. In the last couple of sessions, we've been talking about building tables and formatting tables. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about things that we might think of doing normally in Excel. Sorting things and eventually calculating things. So first, sorting, and then another session about the calculating. Let's go grab a practice file. I would like to open a file named Sort Tables. So I'm going to go up here to File. I'm going to open a file. You're going to do the same thing. Go open a file named Sorting Tables. Let's see. So it's in my practice files here. And list is alphabetized. Sorting Tables. Which come in looking like this. Hey, nice alternating bands of color, nice formatting here. Some bolding over here, got some numbers in there. If I go up to my table tools, when I click on design, you can see these different designs up here in what's called the design gallery. We can have alternating bands of color, have special things happening up in the top rows and left columns and so forth. So kind of nice to be able to have a really professional looking table without having to be great at coloring things in. But what we're here for is to talk first about sorting. Now as I look at the way the table is set up right now, it seems to be sorted by the transaction date. Now as I look at the uh, different amounts on the transaction dates, like here on March 5th of 2010, I've got three transactions in there trying to figure out how they're subsorted within there. Let's see, they're not subsorted by the book title, not subsorted by the quantity sold. Maybe they're subsorted by the retail price. Not quite sure that's true because as I look at 315, I've got a lower, I've got a higher price and then a lower price. So it's kind of hard to tell if they're sorted by much of anything other than the transaction date. Maybe they're just sorted by what order we typed them in in the first place. But maybe what I'd like to look up is What's the biggest sale that we had? Actually, this is a fairly long table as I begin scrolling down. A couple of pages, three pages, quite a bit of data in there. So maybe I'd like to sort it so I have the biggest single sales at the top of the list and the smaller ones at the bottom. So I'm going to do that right now, and then you're going to join me.
So I'm up here in the table tools. We've got design, we've got layout. When I click on layout, one of the things I get is sorting tool here. Now, I don't have to be sitting in the column that I want to sort by, as it turns out. I just have to be in the table. Otherwise, I don't see the table tools in the first place. So while I'm in the table, I'm going to click on sort, and then it says, all right, what would you like to sort by? And when I click on this little pull-down list arrow, I get one choice for each of the different columns that's there. Right now, you can see they're being sorted by the transaction date in ascending order. What I would rather do in this case is I would like to sort by the total column, and I want to see the biggest totals at the top. Therefore, I'll need descending order. That is, I want the big numbers at the beginning of it, and as I go forward through the table, I want those numbers to descend. Which numbers? The total numbers here. So having clicked on sort, I'm now sorting by the total column in descending order. I'm clicking on OK, and it looks like my biggest sale there is $799, followed by a couple of $650 sales, and the numbers descend as I go through the table, as I go forward through the table. All right, it's your turn to try that. So you click anywhere in the table, go to the Layout tab up here, tell it to sort, and again, let's sort it by the totals in descending order. All right, everybody, welcome back. Now, maybe I would like to sort by something else this time. Maybe I would like to see every time that somebody bought boating safety, I would like all the boating safeties to be right next to each other. So we think of sorting as like alphabetizing or putting things from largest to smallest. But another way to think of sorting is by um, groups, by creating groups here is uh, part of what's going to happen when we sort this next time. So I would like to sort by book title, and you can see that, for example, Improving My Tennis Game is in there more than once. Residential Landscaping is in there more than once. So I would like to have it grouped by book title, and then within the book title, let's have it then subsorted by the transaction date in ascending order. So we'll do it both by book title and transaction date, both in ascending order. Here I go. I'm clicking on the sort button. So I'm going to say, all right, in the big groupings, I want it grouped by the book title. And we'll say ascending order. So we'll alphabetize, get the A's at the top, the Z's at the bottom. And then when I have several rows of the same book title, I would like them subsorted by the transaction date, again in ascending order, so that the oldest dates are at the beginning and the newest dates are at the end. All right, so book title, transaction date, both in ascending order. Click on OK. So I've got a group of times when somebody has purchased basic home electronics, and among those times I've got the oldest sale at the top and the newer sale at the bottom. All right, so let's see. I've got uh, August, August, September, October, November, April. Wait a minute, October, November, April. What's so special about that April? Oh, it's the first one of the boating safety here. So I've got them grouped by title, and then within that group I have them subsorted by the oldest to the newest. All right, your turn to do that. So that was sorting by more than one column, and the two columns were book title and then subsorted by transaction date, both in ascending order. You'll notice you can go three levels deep here. There's also one really important thing right here. It has noticed that I have a header row. Now, I'm not sure absolutely about what algorithm it uses to figure out you have a header row, but I certainly think it has something to do with the fact that the header row is all text, and then the rows below there have dates and, and, and numbers and stuff in them. Um, this one is really important that it's figured out I have a header row. Otherwise, it might think that I have a book named book title and sort that down into my list. So that would be a nasty thing. All right, so header row, you should always just check that by eyeball to make sure that it's made the right choice about that. Usually it's pretty good at it, but every once in a while things go wonky. All right, so again, you're sorting by the book title, the transaction date, both in ascending order. Click on OK, everybody. So join me there with our multi-level sort. The next subject we're going to talk about is a little bit of calculation. Word is a little bit clunky at it, but it can do it. So that'll be our next subject of discussion in the next section. So y'all come back now, you hear? Now that we're familiar with sorting a table, let's do a little bit of calculation. And I do mean a little bit of calculation. 
So I have a totals column here that maybe I'd like to total up the totals at the bottom of the table. So I'm going to use my control end key combination to move to the end of my document here. And then I'd like to add a new row down here at the bottom. So I'm going to click in the last cell. And then I'm just going to hit the tab key. Yes, I could choose insert below. Either of those will be fine. And then I would like to put in a formula right down here that will total up this column. And if that's all I want to do, total up a column, man, it's a pretty easy formula to put in because Word has got it kind of set up by default as it turns out. So I'm going to click in this cell where I would like the grand total to appear. And then up here, instead of sorting under the layout tab of my table, I'm going to go to the formula button instead. And when I click on formula, because of the position of this cell, that is a cell that's sitting up under a bunch of numbers, Word assumes that I want to sum up everything above that cell. In this case, that is exactly what I want to do. So I'm going to click on OK, and here comes the sum. Here comes the sum. So do and do do, you're going to do and do do that. You're going to add a new row down there. You're going to click down in that corner. You're going to use the formula button to sum up everything above, and you should see the same lovely answer right down here. So do and do 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 it. Now that's not the only function that's available. So maybe for this third to the last column, I want to count how many rows have data in them here. By the way, if I have a blank row, it won't count it with this function I'm about to use. So I'm not going to total up the quantity sold. I'm going to count how many transactions there were. So I'm clicking down here in my bottom row. This time I'm going to go up to my formulas button. It assumes I want a sum above. What I really want to do instead is this. I'm going to get rid of the word sum. At least I'm going to select it. And then in its place, I see a little list box down here about paste function. And I'm going to click the pull down arrow. I'm going to choose to count instead of sum. Well, I thought I would replace the word sum with the word count. But notice, again, pretty clunky there. So here's the better way to do it in this case. I'm just going to drag across what's there. I'm going to delete what's there. I'm tapping the delete key. Now I'm going to say paste a function. I'm going to choose count. And then I'll put stuff inside the parentheses. But there is still something really wrong here. I didn't point it out to you earlier, but in front of the sum there was an equals. I need an equals in front of this. And at first glance, this looks like it says equals count zero. This is open parentheses and closing parentheses. And in between there, I'm going to need the word above. All right, so I got to finagle it a little bit. I need an equals at the beginning. And then in between the parentheses here, I need the word above. It doesn't happen to be capitalized. So I'm about to count all the cells above this one in that uh, column that have something in them. It won't count the blank ones. I click on OK. I discover I've got 100 rows of data there. All right, so your turn to try that. And again, just the quickest way to do it is you click in the cell, you go to formula, you drag across what's in there, and you can just type it if you want. You could say equals count parentheses above. So instead of summing everything above, we're going to count what's above. And when you hit the Enter key, you should get the same answer you see on mine. So do so. Make it sum above instead of counting above. All right, one other kind of formula here. I'm going to scroll to the top this time because it'll be a little bit easier to talk about this formula. So I got to tell you, right now in this table, I've got a number here, I got a number here, and I got a number here. There isn't really a formula going on in this cell, but there could be. So let's see what that one would look like. It's not going to be summing anything. It's not going to be counting anything. I want to multiply the number in this cell times the number in this cell. And the formula is going to look very much like it would in Excel. It's going to have like an A2 or a B5, those kind of cell addresses except I got to kind of figure them out in my head. So let's see, this is uh, column A, column B, column C, column D, column E. It doesn't say that up here the way it would in Excel, but you got to think of that in your brain. And then this title row is row one. So here's going to be my formula. First of all, I'm going to change some numbers here. So let's say 
that whatever I purchased, I purchased uh, 10 of these basic home electronics books. And the price was actually uh, dollar sign $25. And then over here, I wanted to calculate that. So I'm going to select what's in the cell. And then I'm going to go up to my formula button again. And it assumes I want to sum up everything to the left. There isn't anything above it to sum up, but there are numbers to the left. So it's ready to add the 10 plus the 25. That is not what I need. So I'm going to tell it this function is going to be equal to Column A, B, C, row 2. That 10 is in C2. Times, just like in Excel, that's going to be the star, the asterisk. And then this cell in Excel would be called D2. So that's what I'm going to type in right here. C2 times D2. I click that Enter key, and there it is. 10 times 25 equals that number. All right. Now, down at the bottom of my screen... I had a grand total of the totals. So now I'm going to scroll down there, and it's kind of tough to tell because it was a fairly big number. You won't really know whether it has updated itself or not. I'm going to tell you right now, it did not. But if I drag across what's in there, and I go look at its formula, it's still ready to sum above. And if I click on OK, it will do that. Now, there's another way to do that, and it involves tapping the F9 key, is the keyboard shortcut for reevaluate, recalculate that cell. So it does not automatically calculate itself. I either have to come back here and sort of enter the formula again, or at least open up the formula bar so that I can see the formula again, and then click OK. So in order to tell whether it does anything here, I'm going to click away, and I'm just going to make a little mental note of that. 260, uh, 26,019 is the current number there. So I'm going to go select that uh, data in that cell. I'm going to go up to formula, I'm going to sum above. I click on OK, and you can see there's a new number in there. So either you have to hit the F9 key or just reopen the formula bar and um, put the formula in again, or note that it is the same, and when you click on OK, it will recalculate. All right, so your turn to do that. Do you remember what the formula was over here? You go select it, look at the formula bar. It was C2 times D2. So why don't you change this number here to 10 and change this number to dollar sign $25.00 and then put in the formula over here that says it's going to be C2 times D2. When you hit the Enter key, you should come up with 250 bucks. And then slide on down to the bottom here and refresh that formula. Drag across the numbers that's in there. That's a hard thing to remember. Otherwise, the new number like plugs itself right in the middle of the old number, and you got like a nine-digit number all of a sudden. So you have to drag across the uh, number or text that's in there, and then either tap the F9 key to recalculate, or just open up the formula bar and... Um, Make sure the formula says the same thing, and when you click on OK, it will recalculate. So go do that one. Finish out our calculation section here. All right, now, having said all that, that Word is pretty clunky at doing calculations, if I knew I was going to need to do calculations and I wanted it in a Word document, here's how I would do it in the best of all possible worlds here. I'm going to use Control-N to start a new document. And then if I look carefully under the insert command here and click on the pull down arrow next to table, I actually have a choice down there about Excel spreadsheet. And if I click on that, first of all, look up here in my ribbon, see what's going on in the ribbon right now. It's all Word stuff. When I click on Excel spreadsheet, bada bing, bada boom, it imports an area of Excel. I really shouldn't say import. It opens up an area of Excel. It didn't bring it in from anywhere. And I can see column letters. I can see row numbers. I can do stuff in here. I can do math. In fact, I suddenly have the ribbons from Excel instead of from Word. Yes, I'm still working in Word as soon as I click outside this little box here. Then whatever data I put in there will remain, and I'm back in the Word window. 
And then if I need to go and look at that data again, I point at it here, I give it a double click. It brings back my Excel ribbon, even though I'm in Word. And one thing you might note here, while I've got the Excel ribbon up here, the Save button is not available. There's nothing to save in Excel. You are just temporarily using the superpowers of Excel to do calculations and um, Excel stuff, even though you're really in Word. So as soon as you step out of the Excel part, it'll do all your calculations, and then you save the Word document. So sometimes I'm just handed a bunch of numbers in Word, and I'm supposed to do calculations. Man, I'd be really tempted to go um, select all of those cells and copy and paste them into this um, Excel part. And then do all that stuff in Excel, and I don't have to spend all that time refreshing. So I'm not going to do that in front of you, but I'm just saying, if you know you're going to have to do a bunch of calculations, hey, bring in an Excel table and use the power of Excel inside Microsoft Word. So it's like in Excel inside Word. Kind of like a turducken here. It's right around Thanksgiving right now, so i got turduckens on my mind. So instead of a turkey being inside a duck inside a chicken, it's an Excel inside a Word document. That's the end of our section on calculations and sorting in Word, or maybe even better, in Excel inside of Word. In earlier sessions, we've done just a little bit of text formatting. Let me remind you a little bit about what we've seen. I'm going to type my name in here. And then maybe I'm not so crazy about the font and the size and the color that it's using, so I could modify those things. But if I'm going to do that, I need to select before I affect. So I'm going to go select my name. And I get an immediate little mini toolbar here with the most popular formatting options, like maybe I want to change the font from Calibri to Courier New, so it kind of looks like a typewriter. Maybe I want to make those letters bigger. Maybe I want to change their color. So those are all individual formatting things while I'm at it. Maybe I want to make it italic. So later on, if I want to have something look that way, I could click on it and remind myself, oh yeah, that was Courier New, it was 16 point size, has red font here, and it's italic. But maybe it would be nice if I could have something called a pre-created character style that would apply all of those things at once. And then all I have to do is choose the character style up here. Well, um, we're going to start out by looking at something called heading styles, and we actually have a document for that. So I'm just going to go open a file right here. You don't have to do this thing about putting your name in there. That was just a little review. But let us all go open a file named Heading Styles. So I'm going to my file menu. I'm going to open a file. I'm going to head to my, my practice files here. And we're looking for one called Heading Styles. Here it is, Heading Styles. Double-clicking to open that. And so this is um, our stockholder report. As I look down in the lower left corner, it says it's a six-page document. And it has some styles built in here. So put the video on pause, take just a moment, and join me in the document named Heading Styles, please. All right, so my cursor is automatically flashing here in the first characters. And I can see this seems to be a style called Heading 1. And if I look over here at the side, it's an aerial font. It's 16 point size. It's bold. And then as far as its color, it says automatic here, which in this particular uh, theme that we're using is black. Now I see some other kind of special letters right below it. I'm going to click in those. And I see that those are aerial font 14 bold and italic. And that seems to be called the Heading 2 style. If I click in this normal looking paragraph, I discover that that's actually a style called normal, right there. So these are pre-created styles that come along with the document. They're built into Microsoft Word. Now they won't always look like this. Maybe this was set up with special styles by somebody who knew how to create them. So let's see, I've got one more down here that looks a little bit different yet. Where is he? Initial structure, investment. There we go. So here's one that looks kind of special. Special. And you Saturday Night Live fans from the 70s. Investment and client service. That seems to be a heading three style, which is aerial font, 12 point size, bold. 
So again, these are just reusable combinations of formatting. So let's see how we could create our own styles. And there are several different kinds of text styles. I want to talk about two of them. I want to talk about character styles, and I want to talk about paragraph styles. So in this case, I'd like to go open a document that doesn't have all of these styles applied already so that we can create them for ourselves. So let's head up to our file tab. We're going to go open another file. It's going to be in that same old place. Word sample files. In this case, I want to open up this one named Applying Styles. I double click on that. It's basically got the same text, but it doesn't have those styles applied yet. So I've got a five page document down here and no styles applied yet, other than the normal style that's just applied to everything right now. So take a moment, put the video on pause. Let's open the file named Applying Styles, please. So there are several different kinds of styles, but we're going to concentrate on two of them, character styles and paragraph styles. So paragraph styles are applied to an entire paragraph, even without having to select the entire paragraph. And remember what a paragraph is, everything between the pill crows here. So we're going to start out maybe talking about how could we create a heading one style, or maybe just some kind of paragraph style that we will name for ourselves. And maybe we won't modify heading one style or heading two style or heading three style. I love that live preview thing. So let us select this top line that says to our stockholders. And then there's a couple of ways that we can create this style. We can either apply the formatting that we want in the style and then apply and then name it, or we can create the style and then apply it to the, um, to the text. I'm going to go with the latter method there. I'm going to create the formatting for it and then we'll name it and then we'll apply it to, um, to this text right here. So first step is I'm going to go click on the third arrow to see the entire styles, quick styles gallery it's called. And then there's a choice right here about create a style. So I'm going to go click on that, and it opens up this dialog window where I can name it, and I'll see a little sample of it, and then I should modify it. By the way, I've, I've seen people make a real simple mistake here. They name it, and they click on OK, expecting some new thing to happen with a little dialog window. Um, th that's not going to happen. So what you really should do is name it, and then modify it right here. Yes, you can go back later and modify it, but you know, make life easier for yourself by not stepping out of this thing too quickly. So as far as the name of it, I'm gonna call it Dan's Paragraph Style. And having done that, I'm not ready to click on OK. I wanna click on Modify instead, and that takes me into this window. All right? I would like you to do that much because there's a very special thing we need to talk about in here, and I'd rather not like mix it in a big long discussion. I wanna have its own little thing. So. It doesn't really matter whether you've selected this text or not, but since I did, why don't you do that? And then, again, the way I got this far was I clicked the third arrow in the Styles Gallery. Actually, I don't want to back out of there just yet. I clicked the third arrow in the Styles Gallery, and I clicked on Create New Style. So in that uh, place where you name it, you can use your name instead of mine if you want, or you can just call it Dan's Paragraph Style. And then be careful, don't click on OK, click on Modify so that you come to this window. So go do that, and then we will pick up right there. All right, now, so I've got the style name, and then right below there, I have a style type. And when I click in that box, I see several different style types, paragraph style, character style, linked paragraph and character. I'm not quite ready to talk about linked paragraph and character, but it's the default choice here. Uh, by the way, this choice that you're making right here cannot be changed later. It's one of the few things in Microsoft Word where if you make a mistake in this window, it can't really be fixed. You would have to get rid of the style and make a new one. And later on, we'll talk about how do I get rid of a style. But it's earlier than I want to talk about that. So let us be very careful in this step, and let's make it specifically a paragraph style. So right now, please put the video on pause and change that style type from linked to paragraph, because this is your last chance to make that choice. So put the video on pause, catch up with me. All right, welcome back. You can see that it seems to be based on a style called normal, that is, it's um, accepting that font and that size and so forth. 
And then r right down here it says, what style do you want for the following paragraph? And what this means is, if I make something this kind of Dan's paragraph style, when I hit the enter key, the next paragraph will also be Dan's paragraph style, and it turns out that's hardly ever what I want. So what I want to do is be able to apply this paragraph style, and then when I finish typing something in that style and I hit the enter key, I want it to go back to normal style. So right here where it says style for following paragraph, I'm going to click in there, and we're going to scroll on down through here to find the one called normal. And we'll choose that as the style following the dance paragraph style. So again, put the video on pause and do that right now in this window. You're going to change style for following paragraph to normal. Take a moment and do that, and then we'll pick up right there. All right, everybody, now we're going to set up the formatting for this paragraph style. So let's see, Times New Roman, maybe I'll make that Arial. As far as its size, maybe I want it quite a bit bigger than the normal text. I'll blow it up from 12 point font to about 20 point font. You can see it's gonna be really big compared to the other text. Let's see, maybe I'd like it bold. And I don't really need necessarily a color for it. You could apply a color. Here where it says automatic, you could apply, apply you know, some company color. I'm going to leave it fairly subtle. I'm just going to leave it black. So what have I changed? Well, I changed the font to Arial, the size to 20, added the bold. I can see a little preview of it. Again, put the video on pause and catch up to me there. So we've got a dance paragraph style. It's a paragraph formatting. And the style for the following paragraph is normal. I've changed the font to Arial, 20 point size. I applied bold. Here's what it looks like so far. Catch up with me up to that point. All right, now I want to talk about the bottom part here, the checkboxes. So right now, this is going to be applied to only this document. But if it's one that I've fallen in love with, I could say, well, put it in what's called the, um, the master template, which would mean all new documents from now on could have this style in it. I'm not quite ready to do that. So we're going to leave it as only um, in this document. Little checkbox here about add it to the styles gallery. That means that my style will eventually show up right up here in the styles gallery. I want to go with that. And then there's the thing about automatically update. I'm going to come back and talk about that in just a minute. So we will leave it unchecked. So put the video on pause, compare your screen with mine. It's got a name. It's going to be a paragraph style. The style following is going to be normal. Whatever formatting we've done here, I did Arial 20 point font, bold, black letters. So now that you've compared yours with mine, let us click on OK. So not only did it create that style, but by default it applied it to my text. And hey, there's Dan's paragraph style up in the styles gallery. So we've just built our first paragraph style, and I'm going to end this session right here, and we'll pick it up in our next session. Welcome back. So now we're going to talk about how do we apply these styles. Maybe styles that I've created, maybe styles that are already up here in the, uh, in the Quick Styles Gallery. So, for example, Fiscal Year and Accomplishments. As I look up here under the, uh, the style names, some of them have the pilcrows. They have little paragraph marks. Those are the ones that are paragraph styles. So if I scroll down here a little bit, I see one called Subtitle. It does not have the little pilcrow there, so it's not necessarily a paragraph style. So let's see how we might apply one of these. If it's a paragraph style, like heading two, then I can just click anywhere in the paragraph. Remember, between the pilcrows here is a paragraph. I don't have to select the whole paragraph. I just have to click in it. And then I'm going to go hover over the heading two style, and I can see it being applied there. So I'm going to click on that and apply that to that particular text. So please do that with me. Put the video on pause. Click anywhere in that paragraph about fiscal year and accomplishments and apply the heading to style. All right, so far so good, everybody. So let's scroll down and we'll find another thing that kind of looks like that. Um, like it's going to be the title of something, strategy. So let's try the same thing. Let's click in the middle of that, apply that heading to style. All right, uh, so that's pretty easy so far. Now, what if I want to do that to a bunch of them? So again, pause the video, catch up with me there, make that heading to style. 
All right, so now I'd like to apply that style to a bunch of them. And there are several ways that I can do this. One of the ways to do it is to pre-select multiple areas of text, and then once I have them all selected, then apply the style. So here's a way I can do that. I'm going to click out here in the margin to choose the word financial, and then I'm going to scroll down a little bit, and I'm going to find another one that seems to look like that, like it would be the name of a paragraph. And if I just click out here, then I will select this one, but I would lose the selection of this one. So some of you may be experienced enough that you know that if you hold the control key and select new text, you won't lose the original. So let me demonstrate that. I'm not holding the control key right now. I've chosen organizational structure. And then as I scroll up here, I have lost the selection of financial. But I can do right here what I was just mentioning. I'm going to hold the control key and click next to that. And this time as I scroll down, I discover I have not lost the selection of this one. So you're going to go select the first one, then you're going to scroll down, hold the control key and select the second one. And so far we'll just do that much. And then I'll talk about another way to do this. So you're going to catch up with me. Choose those two bits of text. All right, very good. And then we'll apply the heading to style to both of them at once. So this one changed and this one changed. All right, now um, I want to talk about another way that I can apply styles. And this one works if I have already applied that style somewhere. And this is going to involve this little brush right up here called the Format Painter Brush. So here's how the Format Painter works. You select the text that has the formatting that you like, and then you go click on the Format Painter Brush, and you just let go of the brush, and suddenly my mouse, as I move it over text, it looks like a little eye beam with a brush attached to it. And if I scroll down and find like this part about investment, and I click out here on the side, it applies that through the Format Painter Brush. Unfortunately, if I've only clicked the Format Painter Brush once, then I only get to use it once. Notice how I'm clicking on this one and it's not applying it. So I want to talk a little bit about how can I make the brush stick around for more than one use. So I'm going to start out the same way. I click on the thing that has the formatting that I like. In fact, why don't we stop there and you do that. Uh, so up here you click to select text that has the formatting we like. Go click on the Format Painter Brush, and then come down and apply it to this text. Put the video on pause, catch up with me. All right, now the question is, how can I get it to use that more than once? Well, if you go up and hover over that Format Painter Brush, I'm not ready for you to click on it yet, hover over that and then read what it says. So it's probably too small for you to read it on my screen. So don't click on it, just hover over it. And it will tell you what it's going to do, how you use it. You click on content, it has the formatting you like. Click the Format Painter Brush, click on something else, and it applies it. But maybe more important for my current discussion, right below that it says, FYI, to apply the formatting to multiple places, double-click the Format Painter Brush. So we're going to start out the same way. You have to click to select the text that has the formatting we like. And now we're going to go up and double-click on the Format Painter Brush. Tap, tap. So now I've got that brush in my hand. I'm going to click out here and apply it to an investment in client service. And I still have the brush in my hand because I double clicked on it. So now I'm going to go down and find an investment in infrastructure. All of these places where it's not all capitalized, but it looks like the title of something, you're just going to use the Format Painter brush on that. So far we've been talking about creation and application of paragraph styles that affect an entire paragraph, even if you haven't selected the entire paragraph. Now I want to talk about making a style that will only affect characters that I select. So instead of being called a paragraph style, this will be called character style. So maybe I'd like to make these letters Burt Properties turn green. So I'm going to select those words, Burt Properties, and then I'm going to create a new style for them. For example, maybe I will make them uh, kind of a hunter green right here. And how about bold as well? So I'm going to turn that into a new character style that I can apply to characters that I select. So time to make a new style right up here. Third arrow, create a style. All right. So this time I'm going to name it Dan's character style. Now naming it character style doesn't make it so. And you can see a little preview of it here because we formatted the characters already. Let's click on Modify, 
Now, right now, it seems to be applying to a whole paragraph because it's linked up here, it says. We're going to go up and click on that and change it to just character style, please. And you'll see style for following paragraph is now grayed out. And right now, it looks like it'll still be applied to a whole paragraph, but that's a lie. So Dan's character style, we name it. We're going to make it the style type will be character. where We've got it formatted for bold and green. We want to add it to our styles gallery, so all of that's going well. Let's click on OK. So now I'd like to apply that style. Here's my character style over here. Here's my paragraph style up there. If I use the third arrow, I kind of see them both in there. All right, so um, let us go eyeball and find some more words, uh, Burke properties. That doesn't mean that this style is only for those words. So for example, for some reason, maybe I would like to use fiscal accomplishments is probably not how I would really use it, but I could select those words and then I could go apply Dan's character style and it only affects those words. Okay, so try that out. Let's make that character style. We made it green and bold. We named it Dan's character style. And remember, as you're creating it, you need to switch it from linked to character in the spot where you're defining it. So do that for a moment. Make a new style called Dan's character style. You can use your name instead of mine if you want. Make it bold and green, character style instead of paragraph style. And then apply it to some other words once you've, once you've finished okaying saving that then you can use it on other words. So again, the way this works is you have to select the words and then apply your character style. So we've seen that so far. So that's the difference between a character style versus a paragraph style. Now, what if I apply both of those to something? For example, here's a paragraph style. As I click in here and scroll up in my list, I can see that that's Dan's paragraph style. Now, usually I wouldn't do this, but I just want to mention something here. If I now select this word stockholders and apply Dan's character style to that, you'll see that the character style will override the paragraph style. So that doesn't happen very often that I have to worry about that, but just see that that's true. And it didn't matter which order I did those in. If I um, made stockholders the character style and then applied the paragraph style, it would still work this way. The character style would override the paragraph style. So I'm just going to undo that last step there. So that's the ins and outs of creating paragraph styles and character styles and applying them. All right, I got one more level. So we saw that when we were making a character style, I'm not going to go through with this, but I just want to show you if I create a style, and I'm just going to call it um, the uh, Fernando style, and I modify it. If I leave it as linked paragraph and character, then it can work as either a paragraph style or a character style, and the difference will be whether you have selected text or whether you've just clicked in a paragraph. So I'm going to do this for a minute. You're not going to do it with me. I just want you to see it. So I'm making a, Fernand a style called Fernando. I'm going to leave it as linked, and then the style for the following paragraph I would like to be normal. By the way, right here I can type the letter N, and it will find the one called normal for me. All right, and then I'm going to um, leave that as a linked paragraph and character style, and maybe what it'll be about is making letters red for a moment. So you're not going to do this with me, you're just watching. So there it is. It's sometimes paragraph, it's sometimes characters, and now I'm going to OK that. And so because I only had a cursor in the paragraph, it assumed I wanted it to be used as a paragraph style. And again, if I just click down here and I apply my new created style here, the Fernando style, then it applies to the entire paragraph. But if I have only selected some text in there and I use that Fernando link style, then it treats it as a character style instead of a paragraph style. So you don't need to create that. I just wanted you to see that's what that linked is about. It can be character style. It can be paragraph style. It all depends on what you have selected ahead of time. So you don't need to create that one, but if you want to try it, go ahead and do that. But right now that's going to be the end of my, um, of my styles lesson there for paragraphs and characters. Now, what if I decide that I need to modify one of those styles? Well, here's how we can do it. I can go right up here to my styles gallery. Maybe I'll go find my Dan's character style on the list. So I'm clicking on the third arrow here so I can see a bunch of them at once. So here's my dance paragraph style. Here's my dance character style. 
I'm going to point at that and I'm going to right click on it so that I can modify it. So right here I'm going to change it from green to royal purple. And then the last thing I'm going to do is OK that. And everything that used to be green is now purple. I've just modified that. So put the video on pause and try that. Um, another way to get to that is to click the third arrow here and find Dan's character style right in there. Right click on it and modify it. And change his color. Your turn to do that. Pause the video. All right, now what if I want to get rid of a style? I just want to totally delete it. That's going to take a little bit of a trick. While I can find it up here and right click on one, and one of my choices is remove from the style gallery, all that does is remove the quick way to get there. It doesn't actually destroy the style itself. If I want to make that style not available anymore, I need to go through the little dialogue launcher here. There's other ways to do it, but this is the quickest way to get to the place that I need. So I've just modified a style, so have you. So again, I need to delete a style. This time I'm not going to use the third arrow here. I'm going to use this dialog launcher. And then way down at the bottom, I want to use this button right here. As I hover over it, it'll be hard to read on your little screen there, but its name is Manage Styles. So to get this little dialog, this task pane to appear, I went to the dialog launcher for the styles that opened up this panel and again third little button down here so come join me there all right everybody so this time I don't want to modify one I actually want to delete it so I'm gonna go find Dan's character style on here and I wish that this list was alphabetized I'm afraid that it is not at first it kind of looks like it is but it's not really so I've got Dan's paragraph style was alphabetized in there but Dan's character style, i got to go scroll down a little bit and try to find that thing on this list. Dan's character style I'm looking for. So again, I wish there was a way to alphabetize this list better, but there is not. So there it is, Dan's character style. I'm clicking on that, and then this time I just want to totally delete it. I click on delete. It says, are you really, really, really sure you want to delete this? I call this the, it's the last chance for gasoline before the desert warning and I'm going to click on yes I would like to remove that and then I'm going to OK it and you'll notice not only did it remove it from the list but it removed the application of it every place that I had used it is now back to just normal text All right so again it's your turn to do this you're going to put the video on pause and let me remind you what we did we used the dialog launcher here we went to the third little button down here the manage styles button Go find your character style on that list, and I'm afraid you're going to have to eyeball to find it. And then once you find it, click on it and delete it, and it'll ask you, are you sure? And you'll OK that, and it will be gone. So that's how you get rid of a style that you've created. One last thing I would like you to note that I've mentioned in the past, but this will give me a chance to actually you know, drive it home here. So I'm thinking I'd like to modify Dan's paragraph style. I can do that here, or it's maybe just as easy to do right up here. So I'm going to close my styles gallery. So I'm going to go up and right click on Dan's paragraph style. I'm going to choose to modify it. And let's say I would like to change that from a paragraph style to a linked style. I can do that here. Notice I cannot change it from a paragraph style to a character style. I'm very limited as to what I can change it to. And in fact, in 2016, this is the first time I've ever been able to change it at all. So this is how I could go in and maybe change the style type, but I have a very limited choice as to what I can change it to. All right, I'm canceling out of there. This is why it's really important to make this correct choice when you're creating the style. So I'm just going to cancel out of there. I thought I would mention that. All right, that does end our um, discussion of text and character and linked styles, everybody. Our last subject of discussion for Module 3 is going to have to do with something called outline view. And I'd like to switch documents for this. So uh, why don't we take a moment and use our save as command, not the save command. I don't want to destroy the original version of the file named applying styles. I would like to have a file named applying styles in my finished documents folder and the original applying styles to still be virginal. So I'm going to go to file and choose save as. 
The, those of you who have been taking all of these lessons, you may remember that the uh, keyboard shortcut for Save As is the F12 key. So I'm going through the file menu to the backstage view. I'm clicking on Save As. I'm going to browse for where I'm going to put it. And then I had opened this originally from the, uh, from the practice files, the Word sample files. I want to save this one into my finished Word documents folder. So I've got a little shortcut for it. If you don't have the shortcut, then you'll have to go to the desktop and then go to your finished Word documents folder. So I'm not going to change the name. I'm just changing where I'm putting it. So having used Save As to uh, uh, save this newer version of Applying Styles, I'm going to finish saving that. So please do that. You'll probably get this little message saying you have upgraded to the newest file format, and that's a cool thing, and you'll click OK. So again, Save As. Keep the name, but put it in the different folder. Put it in the Finished Documents folder. All right, so now to continue our last discussion here, let us open another document. And this one we actually used in an earlier module, but hopefully we did a save as there so we didn't destroy the original as well. So I would like to um, open a file named Practice Large Document and make sure you're opening it from your Practice Files folder, not the Finished uh, Documents folder. So here I go. I'm going to go do that. You're going to do this as well. So File and Open, or F12. Browse to your Practice Files folder, that is your Word Sample Files folder, not the finished Word Documents folder. So the Word Sample Files folder, and let's go down and find Practice Large Document. And at first this looks like it's a blank document, but we've actually got stuff down below there. So pause the video and open Practice Large Document from the Sample Files folder. All right, welcome back. Let's show the pilcrows and get rid of some of these pilcrows, some of these hard returns. We'll just select all of those, and I'd also like to select the page break, and then tap the delete key to get rid of those, and then here comes books and beyond and food for your mind and so forth. So, one more time, uh, show the pilcrows and get rid of the pilcrows and the uh, page break up at the top so that your screen looks like mine. All right, and then let's hide the pilcrows. All right, so Books and Beyond is a Heading 1 style. Food for Your Mind is also a Heading 1 style. As I scroll down here, Top 10 Favorites, Heading 2 style. So this thing that I'm going to talk about right now, the outlining, is uh, based on Heading 1, Heading 2, Heading 3, not necessarily styles that I had created for myself. At least the automatic setup is built to deal with Heading 1, Heading 2, Heading 3. All right, so um, here's the first way that I would be able to see this kind of an outline. I'm going to view the navigation pane. That is, I'm going to click on the View tab up here, and then there's a little checkbox about navigation pane. And this is actually the same window we were using for searching earlier. You can even see it says Search Document. But while I'm looking at it, I can click on, you might even see the word Results here. If you do, come on and click on Headings with me. And then I'm noticing what's going on over here. Anything that's a Heading 1 is showing up. Anything that's a Heading 2 is kind of indented. And if I have a place where there's a Heading 1 and a Heading 2, I see a little expander and collapser here. Sometimes we call these twisties. So that's one way to kind of look at, um, at the outline of your document. And one of the cool things that you can do here is, maybe I want to take all of this stuff about bestsellers and the classics and the top 10 favorites, and I want to change the order of those things. So one thing I could do here is collapse this little list, and then I'm going to grab bestsellers in the classics, and I'm going to drag it uh, down here to uh, just before how are we doing so far and after easy listening. All right, so now I'm scrolling up, and there's the stuff that I just moved around. It used to be higher up in my list. Now I have dragged bestseller and the classics, and by collapsing that list, it also brought in the top 10 favorites and the little table that had followed it. So that's kind of a cool thing. This is like the big picture, taking sections and rearranging the sections of my document, hopefully to improve the argument that I'm making in the document. Oh, I should have told him this first and then tell him that other thing later. All right, so why don't you try that? Um, to make the navigation pane appear, you're gonna to go to the View tab. The navigation pane will appear. You'll go over here and click on Headings. And then do what you saw me do. I collapsed bestseller in the classics, and then I actually dragged it up or down. It used to be up here above easy listening. 
Now I've dropped it below easy listening, so you go do the same thing there. Put the video on pause and join me. Alright, just to mention, there's one other way to view that same thing. I think this is a nice, easy way to do it, but this is a relatively new way to do it. The old school way used to be, we would go to the View tab and we would actually switch to something called the Outline View of the Document. And if that's the case, then I really don't need the navigation pane over here. And I can see, how are we doing so far? A little plus sign next to it. Click the plus sign, it selects all of this area. Click that plus sign again, and I'm actually going to drag it down here. And I can see a little, um, you know, little line going across there. And I'm going to drop it down below the section about keep us informed. And that was just another way to reorder the document. I happen to prefer the navigation pane way, but that's the newer way. Hey, why don't we show you the new ways? Here was the old way. Now that you've seen it, eh, probably not any great, great reason to use the old method when we had the new method and I'm going to close the outline view. All right, so hopefully you have had a chance to go to our navigation pane and do the quick and easy way of changing the order of things. So that's outlining your document. Thanks, everybody. Hope you've had fun in Module 3 talking about tables and tabs and styles. Come on back for Module 4 when you get a chance, everybody. For the moment, this is Dan McAllister, Signing off. Welcome back to the wonderful world of Word 2016 with your host, Dan McAllister. Here in Module 4, we're going to be talking about graphics and drawing objects. So let's get started. I'm assuming, again, that everybody has their practice files, that everybody has a finished Word documents folder. So let's get Word started and we'll jump in there. So you can't see it at the bottom of my screen, but I'm clicking on the icon for Word. Now you can see that it's cranking up here. Um, we'll just start with a blank document. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is pictures. But in our sample files, we don't happen to have a lot of pictures. But we did see in an earlier lesson that sometimes our cover pages have pictures. So let's start out that way. Let's go to the Insert tab, and let's tell it we want to insert. I'm going to the Pages pull-down list here. I want to insert a cover page. I'm waiting a little bit for all the cover pages to appear. Scrolling down a little bit, and the one I'd like to use is this one. Uh, it seems to be named Motion, and it's got a picture of a train on it. So let's click on that one. So all we've done is start a Word document, and then we went to the Insert tab, inserted a cover page that has a picture of a train on it. So take a moment, catch up with me, insert that cover page with the train on it. Okay, now we're going to play with this picture a little bit to see some of the cool things that are available in Word for working with pictures. So I'm zooming in on it a little bit so it fills up my screen a little more. So I'm going to click on this picture, and as soon as I do, I get a new ribbon here of picture tools. I may have to click the word format to actually see what's going on in there. And we're not going to play with everything in here, but we're going to see some of the, some of the cooler things in my opinion. So let's imagine that I want this train to come in facing the other direction. Turns out there's a button for that. It's right up here, and I'm going to hover over it, and it says Rotate Object. I'm not looking to rotate it, I'm looking to flip it, but as I look closer at the description, it does say Rotate or Flip the Selected Object. It may be small enough on your screen that it's hard to read while I'm doing it, but if you'll point at it and click on Format under the Picture Tools ribbon, and then hover over this rotate button while you'll be able to see those choices. So I'm going to go click on that, and so if I say rotate 90 degrees, so it flips it, it rotates it like that, rotate it uh, negative, rotate it left 90 degrees, flip it vertically. Oh my goodness, everybody's going to be up on the up on the roof of the train there. Um, I just wanted to flip it horizontally, so it was coming in, going to the right. Now I'm going to flip it horizontally, going to the left. And so why don't you go try that as well? So you've clicked on the picture, otherwise you don't have any picture tools. And then you go up and click on Format under the picture tools and click on Rotate, but flip it horizontally. Put the video on pause. Okay, here we come. We're going to explore a couple more cool things under the pictures. 
Maybe, for example, I would like to see the train, but I don't want to see the people over here waiting, and I don't want to see the clock, and that kind of stuff. So what we're going to do next is called cropping the photo. Um, and again, if I click away from the photo, I'm going to lose all of those tools about pictures. So this is what they call a contextual ribbon. It only shows up in the context of working with a picture. So if you click away from the picture, you will lose that ribbon. If that happens to you, do what I just did. Click on the picture, you'll get it back. So what I want to look at next is uh, this cropping effect. So here's the button for cropping. I'm going to go click on it. And then I've got some special handles now in the corners. Instead of the little round um, resizing handles, I now have these little blocks in the corners. And if I touch the one on the right hand side and drag inward, it's not going to make the picture skinnier. It's actually hiding part of it. I have just cropped that picture. Now, if I go back and touch that same handle and drag to the right a little bit, I will discover the cropped part is actually still there. It didn't destroy it. It only hid it. So why don't you try that? Go crop out the clock. We had to click on the picture. We clicked on the crop button. You get the special handles. Uh, touch the one at the right and drag it inward, and you have cropped out part of your picture. But you can get it back. You just saw. If you crop it again, you can drag the handle the other way, and it's still got the stuff in there. So pause the video. Do some cropping there. All right, next I'd like to have some kind of artistic things happening here. Uh, and the first ones I'm going to show you are called picture effects. And so um, I've got a button for it right up here in the picture styles. We have something called picture effects button. And I'm going to go click on that one. And it's got stuff about shadows and reflections, glowing edges. So I just zoomed out a little bit, and I'm going to go look at some of these picture effects. So I've got stuff about shadows, and it's a little bit hard to see when the, uh, when the ribbon itself is hiding the picture you're trying to look at. Um, so I'm looking at a couple of these, like I've got these glowing edges here. And as I hover over one, it's a little bit hard to see, but I've got a glowing edge around the edge of that picture. If I go ahead and click on that, oh, there's my glowing edge. Not so crazy about that. Thank goodness for undo sometimes, control Z. One that I like a little better than the glowing edges is the soft edges. Uh, in some programs they would call it feathered edges if you've ever worked in uh, picture editing programs in other places. So I'm gonna go back there and do another picture effect. And this time I'm gonna look at soft edges instead of glowing edges. And as I hover, I should see a little live preview there. So you can see the edges are Sometimes they'll call them feathered in programs, as I say. So there's the idea of soft edges. When I click away from it, I can see the, uh, the final effect of that, the soft edges. So feel free to play with that for a minute. Okay, time to look at some more here. I'm clicking on the picture again, so I get my picture tools back. Again, I may have to go up and click on the word format under the picture tools. This time I'd like to work with the brightness and contrast. Um, so there's a button for that over here at the left hand side and the official name of it says corrections But if you'll go hover over that you'll see that it says improve the brightness or the contrast or the sharpness of the picture All right, well, I'm going to click on corrections and now I've got a big grid here of combinations of brightness and contrast So brightness is pretty obvious contrast means how much darker are the dark parts than the light parts so we used to have to do this by number, um, little sliders, and in fact, you can still do that. But it's kind of nice to uh, actually have some presets here of combinations of brightness and contrast. So for example, if I have a picture and I've got people in the background and it's kind of dark back there and I can't really make out who they are, then I might want to go with, with this, uh, change the brightness and the contrast. Now, if I really want to have control of it, I can slide down a little further and click here on picture and contrast options. That actually gives me a whole little dialog window over here where I can play with the brightness. Here I am dragging a little slider to turn down the brightness, to turn up the brightness. I can play with the contrast, how much darker are the dark parts than the light parts. If I turn that way down, there's no difference. Everything's just gray. Turn it up, turn it up. So the light parts get lighter, the dark parts get darker. And if I drag it all the way to the right, sometimes I get kind of a goofy looking effect. That's okay if I'm actually trying to achieve that effect, but I would say I went overboard there a little bit, so I'm gonna kind of drag that back into the middle. You'll see a thing here about picture color. 
And so I can uh, play with the saturation of the color. If I turn that way down, things kind of start going black and white. Drag it to the right. If I go too far, why sometimes things really pop out at me more than I want. So this whole set of choices came from working on the picture and then going over here to the corrections and then picture correction options. That opened up this whole dialog window over here. So don't bother playing with that one too much. I mean, feel free to play with it a little bit with the brightness and contrast maybe. And then I want to move on to the next thing about pictures here. So don't get too hung up in that. All right, I'm going to get some screen space back here. Uh, this format picture dialog window has a pretty big footprint. Um, it's also got its own close button, so I'm going to go click on that. All right, other things up here in our picture toolbar. Uh, I want to look at some not just picture effects, but artistic effects. And for this, I'm going to zoom in. This one is going to be kind of fun. It's probably a little too much fun for this particular picture. Um, but, you know, there are times when I would like to be able to play with these. So I'm going to go up and click on Artistic Effects. And then as I hover over these, I should see Live Preview. There's one called Glow Edges. Not the picture, but the actual, ob not the edge of the picture, but the actual picture itself. And so here's one called Photocopy. And I got one here um, called Light Screen. Got one over here is kind of a water glass effect. So I'd like to just give you a couple of minutes to get in and play with these. Again, you know, for a real businessy thing, you probably don't want to go with these. But if you're doing advertising and you want to have some kind of special effects, these are actually pretty cool, these artistic effects. They're kind of like um, Photoshop filters. So play, take just a minute and play with those artistic effects. I may never get you back. I might never be able to get your attention back once you're playing in those. So put the video on pause, play with those artistic effects for a minute. So that's about enough for just the pure picture stuff. I'm going to end this session, and when we come back, we're going to talk about something that used to be called clip art, but is now changed to the words online pictures. So I'm ending our session right here about just playing with the picture. Feel free to play with it a little bit longer. And then when you're ready to come back and talk about other things, so I start this next lesson. So in this session, we're not going to use pictures that are already on our hard drive. We're going to use some pictures that are available on the web. This term used to be called clip art. And there were a few of these pictures that were already on your hard drive in what was called the clip art gallery. But there weren't very many of them. You used to kind of have to grab stuff from office.com's clip art gallery by going to the web and doing that. They don't have a clip art gallery anymore. What they do now is let you use online pictures from the Bing website. Or if you actually sign in, like it says up here, sign in as yourself, then you could get pictures from your Facebook page, for example, or from your corporate uh, SharePoint drive, things like that. So we're not really talking about SharePoint today. So I would like to bring in some pictures in another way, and it's called online pictures. So I'm going to go get a practice file here, tell it to open some other document down here. I'm going to navigate to our Word sample files folder, of course. And I'm going to bring in a document named ClipArt. Just double clicking on that. And here it comes. And mine at the top of my screen says it's opening in protected view, and I'm going to click on Enable the Editing. All right, so you know the drill. Go catch up with me. Put the video on pause. Open up the document named Clip Art. There's no clip art in it. Right now it's just text. Looks like it's about three pages of text, it says down here. And I'm going to go to the top. So let's say that as part of this, I would like to get a picture of, how about a doctor? So I get to choose where I want that picture to appear, and then I can decide to move it around if I need to. So I'm just kind of flipping a coin right now. I'm going to click right at the beginning of this sentence that says, most controls offer a choice of using the look from your current theme. What that has to do with a doctor, I don't know, but I'm just making stuff up here. So here we go. Let's see how to bring in a picture of a doctor from, um, from the web. So I'm going to go to my Insert tab, and I've got one called Pictures. 
but that would be pictures that are on my hard drive. And in fact, in the sample pictures, there's only one, and it's in, the, um, it's in a subfolder called Townhouse Web Graphics. We'll be playing in that in just a couple of minutes. But first, I would like to explore this one called Online Pictures. This is the new name for what used to be called Clipart Gallery. So I'm going to click on Online Pictures. By the way, it will be inserted whether, wherever my flasher is. Some people call it the cursor. I choose to call it the insertion point. Uh, that makes it a little more obvious as to why a picture would be inserted there, because it's called the insertion point. So I'm going to click on Online Pictures. Opens up a little dialog window here. And then I've got choices about bringing in pictures from my SharePoint site or from the Bing Image Search Gallery. So I'm going to go over here, search Bing, and I'm going to type in the word Doctor. And when I hit the Enter key, I get some kind of cartoony doctors over here. As I scroll up and down, everything is kind of cartoony doctors. So what if I want like a real looking picture of a doctor? Well, I'm reading what it says down here. I'm going to magnify it on screen here. Search results right now are images licensed under Creative Commons licenses. Please review the specific license for any image you want to use to ensure that you comply with it. All right, but they don't actually have a way to do that. They don't have a way in this window to review the specific Creative Commons licenses. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with that term, but these are licenses that people who own pictures, who own the copyrights to pictures, can make them available to the rest of us. So sometimes uh, newspaper websites will have something they call the, uh, the morgue file. It's kind of a nasty word for it, but it just means pictures that they've used in past stories that uh, they want to make available to the public, and they're willing to give up their copyright um, issues of those things. Uh, now, if I click on, I'm, I'm saying don't do this. If I click on show all web results, then I will see lots of real pictures of doctors, but I'll have no idea which ones of those are actually copyrighted. So what I tend to do is actually step out of PowerPoint at this point. So if I want cartoonish online pictures, why these are great. I can just click on one of these and put them in there. But if I want a picture of a real doctor, I'm afraid I actually have to step out at this point. So I'm going to click on Cancel, and I'm clicking out of that window. So here's what I'm going to suggest doing instead, and you're going to watch me first, and then you'll do it with me. So I'm going to go to the web. I'm going to open up a browser here. And I'm going to send it to Bing.com. Might as well make a little lesson out of this. Uh, you're probably quite aware that when you're trying to go to a website like www.bing.com that you don't have to type the www. But there is actually a way that you can avoid having to type the .com as well, and I'm going to use it right now. So up here in the address box, also called the Universal Resource Locator, URL box, I'm just going to type Bing. And then, now since I've been there recently, it tries to add the .com, but let's imagine it wasn't doing that. So I just type Bing. Now, if instead of hitting Enter, I hold Control and tap Enter, it will put the www.com sandwich around the Bing. So, for example, if I wanted to go to www.sears.com, I could just type Sears, hold Control and tap Enter, it would take me to www.sears.com. All right, so I'm backing out of there, and this time, while I'm at uh, the Bing website, I'm going to go look for Dr. And so it shows me websites about doctors, it shows me pictures about doctors, but I want to be more specific here and just see pictures. There is a button right here about images, and I'm going to click on that. All right, so now I've got a bunch of images here, but it's really hard to tell which of these might have copyright issues. But there is a choice right here about license. So I'm hoping that maybe by the next version of Microsoft Word, they'll have this clickable button about license right in the interface of the uh, online pictures gallery there in Word. But right now you have to go this way. So I'm going to click on license, and I see several choices under there. All the pictures that are available, many of which would have copyright issues. Pictures that are in the public domain. Pictures whose owners have allowed us to freely share and use them or freely share and use them commercially. That's maybe a little more important. 
free to modify and share and use commercially. So these are all different levels of Creative Commons licenses. So if I just choose public domain, then many of my pictures disappear, but not all of them. So any pictures that are in the public domain means that their owners have given up the copyrights for them. Um, so that's like the most liberal one, public domain. Now I've got some others here, free to share and use. Click on that. Sometimes some of these pictures disappear, but I've still got pretty good pictures of doctors here. So I'm going to flip a coin and uh, click on one of these. And so now I can see that picture. And then if I point at it and right click on it, I get some choices like make a copy of it, which will load it into RAM memory, and then I can paste it into my document. Or one of the other choices is save the picture itself and put it on my hard drive because I'm going to want to use it a lot and I don't want to have to keep come looking it up on the web. Um, I understand that you know it's, uh, it's allowed under the Creative uh, Copy licenses there, Creative Commons licenses, I should say. So in my case, I'm just going to copy it and paste it. So when I click on copy, that just loaded it into RAM memory. Going back into my document, here's my insertion point flashing. Right there is where I'm going to insert that picture I just copied, but not by choosing insert, but by choosing paste. So I'm going to the home tab, and I'm going to paste that thing I just copied from the web. And there is my picture. I'm going to zoom out a little bit using control on the scroll wheel, and then maybe I'll make the picture a little bit smaller as well. And so right now it's what's called an online picture. In our next session, we're going to talk about how can we wrap the words around that picture. So what you're supposed to do right now is with your cursor flashing, with your insertion point flashing somewhere in that document, you're actually going to step out of Word. You're not going to close it. You're just going to leave it running. Go start your favorite web browser. I happen to be using uh, Internet Exploder. And I went to Bing. I went to the Bing website. And we just take a couple of steps back here on the Bing website. So I typed in Doctor. And then I went down here and clicked where it said licenses, and maybe try public domain. That's, those are the ones that are sort of most freely usable. So public domain, you should still actually have some real pictures of doctors, not just the cutesy little cartoon thingies that we had when we were looking at online pictures built into uh, Microsoft Word. And then pick one of these. If you click on the picture, it will very often take you to a bigger version of the picture. And if you were to click on it again, it would actually take you to the website where the picture um, was found. But all I did was right-click on it and made a copy of it, loaded it into RAM memory, and then went back to my Word document and pasted it. So that's your job right now. Go find a picture of a doctor and uh, make a copy of it, and then go back to your Word document and paste it in at the insertion point. When I had my flashy insertion point in front of the word most, and then inserted that picture, or in this case, copied and pasted the picture to insert it. Um, it inserted it right in front of that letter, uh, kind of like just a big A in here, and then it leaves a whole bunch of white space around the edge. And sometimes we like that, other times maybe we'd like to wrap the words around the edge of that, kind of like a newspaper story wraps around the edge of a picture. So here's how we're going to do that. I'm going to click on the picture so that I got my picture tools format commands up here again. I'm going to click on Format, and one of the ways that I can do this is to click on this button that says Wrap Text. And so I'm going to wrap the text square around the picture. I love that live preview right there. So I'm going to wrap the text square. I would like you to do that, of course. So click on the picture, put the video on pause, go up to the Picture Formatting Tools, click Wrap Text, and wrap it square around the edges. All right, welcome back. Now, you may have noticed another choice up there called Tight. But right now, Tight won't do anything for you because what it should do is wrap tightly around the edge of this picture, but it can't because there's white space back here. The white background is built into the picture. So we're not going to click on Tight just yet. What we're going to do is take this white background and turn it transparent. And this is going to happen through a button over here called Remove Background. So I'm going to click on the Remove Background button. And anything that's purple right now is about to be removed from that picture. And I've got some tools up here about removing background, what to keep, what to throw away. Now, in my opinion, the best thing to try first 
is to grab this handle and drag it right to the edge of the picture up in that corner. And then maybe grab this handle down in the bottom right and drag it out to the edge of that picture. And sometimes that's enough to get it to choose exactly what I want to keep and the purple stuff is exactly what I want to throw away. So I would like you to try that. You're clicking on the picture and then right now I'll say discard all changes so I can start that over again. So you click on the picture, you come right over here to remove background and then grab the corner edge and drag it out to the corner of the picture. Grab another corner edge, drag it out to the corner of the picture. Sometimes that's enough to get it to throw away and keep exactly what you want. So that's your job to do right now. And then when you drag it out to the corner, just make sure there's no purple on his head, like it's not going to chop his head off, anything like that. And then if everything is well, you just come up here and click on Keep the Changes. And at first it'll be a little bit hard to tell that anything has happened. But when we go to Wrap Tight, it should be able to wrap tightly around his body. And I'm going to go up and do that next. Wrap Tech and tight. Ooh, there it is wrapping around his body. Your turn. Put the video on pause. First you need to remove the background. You've probably done that already. And then go up to the wrap text and wrap it tight, please. All right, so you can see that there are good things about this and some bad things about this. For example, as I zoom in on him, I'm looking at the words. Most controls offer a choice of using the look from the overall look of tab to change the quick style set provide reset document insert wait a minute what's going on there well what's going on there is it's not like making the words go this way they're still going across here so most controls offer a choice using the look from the current theme or a format that you specify directly to change the overall look so you can see that what that does is break the words up now maybe i still like the the tight wrapping on this side, but maybe I would like these words to stay over on the right side of that picture and not use up this area. So here's a pretty advanced way to adjust where it's allowed to put words or not. So here we go. I'm clicking on the picture so I can get my picture tools back. I'm going to go up here and click on wrap text. And then this time, I would like you to see something called edit wrap points. And here's kind of an odd thing. You won't be able to use edit wrap points unless you have first used tight. So those two things need to go together in your brain. Edit the wrap points is what I'm about to do right now. So I'm clicking on that choice. I've got the picture selected, wrap text, edit the wrap points. So now I see a bunch of little dots surrounding this guy. These are called Bezier points, B-E-Z-I-E-R. And you can use these to take up space where you don't want the words to go. For example, I'm going to touch this Bezier point, and I'm going to drag it out here. And now you'll see that the words can't wrap in this little spot. Maybe I'll drag it farther out there. Maybe I'll drag it right out to here. And then I could take another one and kind of drag it over here, and take another one and drag it down here. And so I'm marking out places where I don't want it to wrap, even though otherwise I still want it to wrap tightly around the side. Same thing down here. These two words, they look kind of funky down there. Grab a Bezier point, drag it right up there and use up that space. And then as soon as you click away, you don't see the little Bezier points anymore. And you have done a really cool tight wrapping. So it's your turn to do that. You're going to go click on the picture. You had to do the tight first. If we hadn't done the remove background, trying to choose tight would still look square because it had that white background, we removed the background and made the background transparent. That way when we told it to wrap tight, it wrapped tight, but it wrapped around both of the sides. And then to edit where it is allowed to wrap, we clicked on it one more time, and we went up to the formatting of the tool and the wrap text, and we did the edit wrap points to get those to show up, and then we dragged them out here to use up space. Okay, your turn to do that. Put the video on pause, and wrap away, everybody. All right, I got to tell you, if you're not having some fun editing this stuff and wrapping text around the pictures, you're just not trying, man. This is way too cool. All right, I'm going to end this session right there. When I come back with the next session, we're going to start talking about word art as opposed to the old term clip art. And we're going to build a uh, little um, uh, advertisement here because the word art is sometimes a little too cutesy for um, hard business things. 
So I'm going to end this session and we're going to come back and mix up some pictures and some word art. See you in a minute. Hey everybody, I hope you're having some fun here. Uh, if you are saving these documents as you go, don't click the save button. That would destroy the originals. Make sure you're using save as and put the copy in your finished documents folder. All right, time to start a brand new document with the control and the letter N. And we're going to build an advertising flyer for an open house for a townhouse that's available for rent. So let's start putting in the words. How about townhouse for rent? We'll hit the enter key about four times, maybe one, two, three, four. And then we're going to fill in some information about the fact that we're going to have an open house here. So open house. I'm hitting the enter key. That's going to happen on uh, Sunday, December 6th of 2016. Hitting the enter key. That's going to take place from 11 to about 11 a.m. till 2 p.m. All right, a couple more enter keys. Put in the address of this place, which is going to be 123 Elm Street. I'm thinking of Freddy Krueger, anybody who's old enough to remember those slasher movies. 123 Elm Street in uh, Bakersfield, California. I keep using Bakersfield because it's my wife's hometown. Uh, 93033. So that's the information that we need. Now we're going to dress it all up. And the way we're going to dress it up would probably be a little too cutesy. A little too imaginative for just a business letter, but for advertising like this can be very effective. So we're going to talk about putting in some pictures and doing a couple more things with that, but we're also going to talk about something called word art. So let's see our first example of word art. Come with me and we will select townhouse for rent, drag to select that text, and then come with me to the insert tab. And then over here at the right hand side, there's a button when I hover over it that says insert word art. Now, depending on the resolution of your screen, you might be able to see those words insert word art without having to hover over the button. But don't worry if your screen looks a bit different than mine in that way. So I'm going to click on the button for inserting word art, and I've got some fancy schmancy letters that are available here. You're not going to see a live preview as you hover over them. And whichever one you choose here, you are not locked into that. You can come back and make changes. So I'm just going to kind of flip a coin and choose one of these guys. Oh, look what it did to my text. Hey, made it really big. And the text is automatically centered in that box. And I would like to make this box just as wide as my document is. Now, if I click away from that box, I can see the margin up here. But if I click inside that uh, text box, the only thing I see for white is the width of the box here. But it turns out there's a cool thing that will let me know when I've lined something up with the top of the document or with the right or left margin of the document. So I'd like you to watch what I'm about to do. I'm going to grab the resizing handle here and I'm dragging to the right. And as soon as I start dragging, I see a green line at the left hand side showing me that I'm lined up with the margin. I see a horizontal line going across the top that tells me I'm at the top margin. And if I keep dragging to the right, when I get to the right margin, ooh, there's another green line. That's called auto grid. And when I let go, that's a nice way to kind of line things up and notice the words are centered in there. All right, your turn to do that. So you select the text first, you drag across the words, townhouse for rent, go up to the insert tab, the insert tab, and then go with the word art of your choice. Then make the box wider until you see the automatic grid line telling you you've lined up with the right hand margin. All right, I'm assuming that you have paused the video and that you've caught up with me. All right, next I want to bring in a picture. So I'm going to click down below the thing that says townhouse for rent, and I'm going to bring in a picture by inserting it. So I'm going to go up to the insert tab, and this time it's not going to be an online picture. It's going to be just the picture button. And in our sample files, the only pictures that we have are in here in the subfolder named townhouse web graphics. So double click to go into that folder. And let's maybe use the one that says townhouse front. Point at that picture, give it a double click. There it is, comes in there fairly big. 
And that's because if the picture was created in a size that's maybe bigger than an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, when you bring it into Word, it will shrink down the picture to fit between the margins. So do that. Do what you just saw me do. You've clicked away from the Word art. You put your cursor down below there, also called insertion point, and then you inserted a picture at the insertion point. Insert picture. Got to go up there to the townhouse web graphics and then double click on the townhouse itself to get this humongous picture to go in there. All right. Next thing I want to do is show you another cool thing about word art. So let's go up and uh, select the text for the word art. You're going to get your drawing tools format tab to come back again. You're going to click on format. And I was mentioning that whatever kind of word art you choose, it's not etched in stone. And so right now, while I've got that word art selected, I can see a group of buttons over here called word art styles. And so there's one called quick styles. Gee, that looks familiar. That's pretty much like what we saw when we inserted it in the first place. But now I can finagle it a little bit. Um, I'm going to click on, I'm going to hover over this top uh, button. It says it's the text fill. I'm going to click on the little pull down arrow. And maybe I'd like to fill the inside of these letters with uh, canary yellow. I love that live preview. If I decide I'm not so crazy about that, I can hover over some other color, like an orange or a blue or a green. I'm going to go with the canary yellow. You can feel free to choose some other color of your choice. Next thing I'm going to color is the, the edge of the letter, the outline of the letter. I hover over the next button. It says text outline. And I'm going to click on the pull down arrow for that. And I'm going to choose something other than the fill color. If I go with yellow for the outline, it's pretty hard to tell that there's much of any outline there. It leaves a little ghost of one, but maybe I'll put, uh, I don't know, how about a fire engine red outline around the end of that thing. So your job so far is to catch up with me on that. Select the text up here in your drawing tools format. Choose an inside the letter color. Choose a border color for the letters. And next we're going to play with this little button. So catch up with me so far. All right, I think this next button is pretty darn cool. It's different text effects, like shadows. And I'm seeing a live preview of the little drop shadow on the edge of the letters there. I'm not actually clicking on one. I'm just hovering over it. They've got a thing here about reflections. I hover over it. I can see a reflection of the letters. Or a reflection that has a little bit of a 3D effect. Again, I'm not actually choosing it. I'm just hovering to see the live preview. Earlier, we saw glowing edges for a picture. I'm going with glowing edges for my text. That might be a little too much. Uh, the bevel, it's pretty hard to tell what those things do. Usually you need some shapes, you know, deal with some shapes for that. So I'm going to skip over the bevel. We've got a 3D rotation. Not exactly what I want here, but useful for some things. What I really would like you to see is down here where it says transform. So this is a way that you can actually make your letters take a shape, like a curve or a little uh, swivel here or a, uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away effect. I call that one. So I'm going to go with this one called arch up. And when I click on that, kind of tips up the middle and leaves the ends down there. Now, for some of these, you can then adjust how much it curves by grabbing some little uh, dot that's available. But in this case, I'm usually not successful at getting that one to curve very much more. So your turn to try that. You're going to select those letters. You went over here. You filled in a color. You went here. You did an outside color. And then in here, play with transform. And feel free to try one of these other shapes if you like. But I like the, the one where it's high in the middle and lows on the end. There's an old joke, an old kid's joke about that, about spelling Ohio. Why it's round on the ends and high in the middle. Okay, let's take it from there now. Why don't I end this session and we'll come back and we'll do some more with the text down here. Now, to make this a little bit less formal, I would like to do a little thing with the picture here. First thing I want to do is maybe zoom out. I'm using Control and the scroll wheel to zoom out a bit. And then I'm going to click on the picture and actually make it smaller by grabbing one of the corners and dragging inward to make the picture itself smaller. And then if I want the picture still centered from left to right, I can center the picture the same way I center text. That is, with the picture selected, I can go up to the Home tab 
and click on this button right here to center, in this case, the picture from left to right. Not top to bottom, but left to right. So do that, put the video on pause, make the picture smaller, and then center it left to right, and then come on back. All right, now with handles on the picture, go up here and click on the word format to get picture tools. We've been in here before, but we didn't play with any of these guys called picture styles. We saw picture effects, but not the picture styles. So I'm going to click on the third arrow here in the styles gallery, and then I'm going to hover over some of these picture styles. Your turn to try that. So click on the picture, go up to Picture Tools Format, and take a look at some of these different picture styles. And I'm going to go with this one that kind of tips it a little bit. You can feel free to try any of the other ones that you like. So it looks a little bit like a postcard there, sort of. So I've got the cutesy curvy letters, i got the postcard effect on the picture. So click on the picture and try some of those picture styles there. Give you a minute to play with that. So pause the video, play with the styles, and then we're going to pick up with some more word art. All right, what I want to make this stuff look like down here is like two little cards, uh, kind of like business cards, overlapping each other. So we're going to turn it into word art first. Let's go select the text about the open house. And then to get the words to appear a little bit closer to each other vertically, I would like us to go up to the Home tab, and there's a button right here called Line and Paragraph Spacing. When I click on it, there's a choice down here to remove spaces after the paragraphs. And you'll notice that's going to put those paragraphs closer together. And then I'm going to recommend that you do that with the lower section as well with the address. Select it, Line Spacing, remove the space after the paragraphs. All right, pause the video, catch up with me there. It's really quick. All right, now we're going to modify word art here. Um, let's see, we've already got this bottom stuff selected, so why don't we start with that. With it selected, we're going to go to the Insert tab, and we're going to insert word art. And you know you can change it later. You can change the font size, you can change the outline, you can change the fill colors. We've been playing with that a little bit. Why don't we make this a bit smaller? So I'm going to select the text. And I'm going to go to the Home tab, and right now it's set as the default 36 points. By the way, a point is 172nd of an inch. So 36 points is half-inch tall letters. So I'm going to make them a bit smaller. How about like 24? So go do that with me. Turn, Select that text, turn it into word art, and then make it 24 size instead of the default 36. Pause the video. All right, welcome back. Remember, you're always free to rewind the video a little bit if you need to, but I always try to like wrap a little bow around the thing before I make you do it. I'll, I'll you know, reiterate how I did it. All right, we are going to do a similar thing. All right, we're gonna do a similar thing to the part about open house up here. Select that text, turn it into word art. That is insert word art from it. Holy cow, that looks funky. Good news is I can grab its border and move it around if I need to. Let's make the letters smaller, 24 point size. You don't actually have to select them when they're in a word art box. You can actually just go up here to the Home tab and change the size right here from 36 to 24. And then I'm going to grab the edge of the border and I can move it around and not put them right on top of each other. But what I'm going to want to do in a minute is tip them both sideways a little bit and then do lay them over top of each other like a little business card. But you notice right now as they overlap, I can see through it. And that's because in this word art, there's transparency behind the letters. I would actually like to fill that rectangular shape with a white background. So in order to do that, I'm going to go up here and click on the Format tab here for my drawing tools. And this time I'm not talking about the word art styles and the filling and the borders of that. I'm talking about the shape styles over here. So right now the fill is that it's transparent. I'm going to click on Shape Fill, and I'm going to change it from No Fill to White. And that way you'll notice it's actually kind of covering up part of the thing behind it. But I'd also like to have a nice black border around the edge of it, 
So while you're doing the shape fill, setting that to white, let's change the shape outline to, how about black? So now I got this thing that looks a little bit like, you know, uh, it's not really looking like a business card too much, but it is an object that I can move around. So catch up with me. You're selecting that text. You've turned it into word art already. Now you click in it. You're going to go up here to the uh, drawing tools format. And you can do a shape fill of white and a shape outline of black. And then, in fact, while you're doing it, why don't you do that same thing to that other word art here? That is, go select it and shape fill for white and shape outline for black. Your turn. Go catch up with me there. All right, welcome back. We're kind of coming down the home stretch here. So I want to take the open house card and put it up here. And then I want to take the 123 Elm Street card and kind of move it over here a little bit. And then maybe I'll even tip the uh, tip the Elm Street card. So I'm trying to uh, set these up so that when I rotate the Elm Street card this way, I can then maybe tuck it in here in a spot where it's kind of overlapping the other card but not overlapping any letters. And right now, as I click away from it, all right, so this one is on top. I would like this one to be on top instead. So take a moment, catch up with me there. White fill, black border. All right, now we're gonna talk about the layering here. How can, how can you choose which one is on top? So I'm gonna click on this one. I'm just gonna check one last time, make sure that I've done the uh, white fill. Yep, I did. It used to say no fill, now it's white fill. Now I want to bring this one to the front. There are some buttons up here about bring forward, send backward. And if I click on a pull down arrow next to bring forward, there's actually a choice called bring it to the front. Now in this case, with only two layers, there's no difference between bring it forward one level versus bring it to the front. But as soon as I have three or more layers, then bring it forward means one layer at a time, as opposed to bring to the front, which means bring it all the way to the front. So in this case, I've only got two layers. I want to bring this one forward or to the front. And now it looks like it's laying on top of the other one. And this is going to be my fairly informal looking um, advertisement for our townhouse open house. All right, catch up with me there. You've already done the white fill and the black background. All there is to do now is to rotate the things and then choose which one is in the front. And all that happens as you go to uh, drawing tools format. All right, finish that up, everybody. All right, great work. Now, if I don't want a white background, I can go in there just one more time and choose some other fill. So I could go to Format and choose some other fill color there. Oh, this would be for the letters. I'm talking about the shape. So you could feel free to do that, you know, make one of them one color, one of them another color, or just leave them white. That is totally up to you. So I'm zooming out now. I'm control scrolling outward, and that's what my flyer is going to look like. Again, this wouldn't be a great thing to do for a formal, you know, business letter, but uh, great for advertising, thinking out of the box, trying to catch people's eye. So one last thing for this flyer. I'd like to make a note that uh, the first 10 people who show up for my open house get a free door prize. So I'm going to do that by inserting a shape. By clicking on insert, I get a choice here for shapes. When I click on shapes, I've got squares and ovals and arrows and all kinds of cool things. And if I scroll down a little bit, I have stars and banners. I'm going to go with this explosion here. Um, as I hover over it, it says its name is Explosion 2. I'm going to click on that, and then I'm basically going to drag diagonally to open up an explosion shape right there. And I'm going to change its fill color to maybe canary yellow. And I'm going to make it a little bigger. I may decide that I need to move it off the picture sooner or later, but I'm just going to click right in the middle of it here, and I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to start typing door prize to the first 10 viewers. 
Now it's a little hard to see me typing that because it automatically put white letters in there. But if I drag across those letters, I can change the letter color by going to the Home tab and changing the font color here to something other than white or yellow. How about red? How about I'll make them bigger than 11 points? And I click away. All right, so put in an explosion there if you would. Um, by the way, you can then uh, resize the shape if needed. And sometimes the words will wrap inside there. All right, so give it an explosion and tell them that you're going to have a door prize to the first 10 viewers. If you want to make that in a different color, you can. You know, choose what color you want to fill it with and what color you want for the letters. All right, that's the last piece of our flyer, everybody. All right, I'm going to save this one. I'm going to put it in my finished documents folder, and I'm going to call it Townhouse Flyer. So that was pictures and word art all together. Thanks, everybody. Our next subject of discussion involves using multimedia in our Word documents. Sound files, video files. Wait a minute, isn't Word a printable thing? Yes, but you could also send a Word document around attached to an email with information about the new commercial spots that you've just purchased for the company and you want the people to be able to hear the commercial. Or maybe it's an audio of the boss giving the state of the business address. Or maybe it's a video of the TV commercials that you've paid for. In my case, I'm going to have a document about jazz music, and we're going to have a sound file in there, and we're going to have a video file in there. So let's get started. We're going to open other documents down here. We're going to navigate to our um, Word Practice Files folder. And inside there, there's a subfolder called New for Jazz. I'm going to double click right there. And I'll start with a document named Jazz Start. Double clicking, here it is with some fancy schmancy text and a little description of my attempt to explain what the heck is jazz. So join me there, put the video on pause, go to that subfolder named New for Jazz and open the file named Jazz Start, please. All right, now that we're all in the same place, if you wanna read a little bit about jazz, feel free to do that. This is a picture of me playing my uh, trombone. A little bit more about jazz, even a picture of some jazz music here. Any of you who read music, you'll be able to read that music and hear it at the same time momentarily here. So I'm zooming in just a little bit, and I'm noticing that down here in the corner, it says place an audio file here. Now if I just click and put an insertion point there and place the audio file there, I'll still see the words place an audio file here. So I'm actually going to select that text, and I'm going to tap the delete key. And having done that, the headline from the next page has moved up. I'm just going to cheat, hit the Enter key, kick it back down, and then put my cursor back up here. So take a moment and do that. You've got the file open. Scroll down a little bit, get rid of that text that says Insert Audio File here. Put the video on pause, and then come on back. All right, now it's time to actually insert said audio file. So I'm going to go to the Insert tab, and there isn't any choice up here that says Audio File. Not even if I hover over these little buttons up here. There's none of them that says audio file. But right up here, there is a button labeled insert object. And oddly enough, it's in a group called the text group, but I'm not actually going to be inserting text in this case. So I'm going to go up and click on the object button. Opens up a dialog window here. And my choices are create a brand new object in Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop or um, and the programs that show up here will depend on what programs you have installed on your computer. But in this case, I don't want to create a brand new one. I've already got it stored in a file. So there is this alternate tab right here about inserting this, in this case, music object from a file that exists already. So that's where I'm headed next, create from file. All right now I have to browse to my folder my new for jazz folder that's in the word sample files folder that lives in the house that Jack built. And the name of the file that I want to insert is named close by some bum named Dan McAllister. So this is actually your music that I wrote. So I'm going to double click on the file named close. Now I could link to that file, but in my case, I just want to embed that sound file right in my word document. 
Uh, the disadvantage of that is it increases the file size of the Word document. The advantage of embedding that sound file is that if the original sound file becomes corrupted or moved to a different folder or, or the name has changed, then this file will still work because I've got actually a copy of it right in my Word document. So I'm not going to link to it. Uh, I see a checkbox here about display as icon. It's actually going to display it as a little icon even if I don't tell it to. So all I've done is uh, give it the path to that sound file, and now I'm clicking on OK, and here is the little icon that represents my sound file. And then to actually hear it, what I do is double click on it. Tap, tap. Opens up my Windows Media Player. It says, are you sure you want to open this thing? I'm going to say, yep, open away. Any of you who read music, you're right about here. The bridge. There's a sound file. So it's your turn to finish doing that. I think you already deleted the text. So now you're going to put the video on pause. You're going to go to the insert tab. You're going to insert object. You're going to click on the create from file. You're going to browse to head to our new for jazz folder. You're going to double click on close. That will put the icon down at the bottom corner of that page. OK your way out of there. And then double click on the uh, icon to play the sound file for yourself. Have at it, everybody. Put the video on pause. Catch up with me inserting that sound file, please. When you come back, we'll start another session where we insert a video file from a uh, file that we have on disk. Welcome back. In our previous session, we inserted this audio file. I also have a video file that I'd like to insert. So there's a little discussion about um, if you're just starting with a small ensemble, why, you can maybe just call out the song, and in the middle of it, you can change beats, change from a rumba to a samba to a swing beat, and just talk to each other on stage while you're doing things. But once you start getting more than about five or six people up there, it might be better to put together an arrangement so it sounds like you actually kind of know what you're doing and you're not stepping on each other's toes. So I actually have a video of a small version of a big band. Uh, yeah, I know that's kind of a confusing term there. But if I scroll down a little bit, I see a place to place a video here. And I'm going to do a similar thing that I did for the audio. In fact, it's going to be exactly the same. It's just that the file name will be different. So I'm going to drag across the text. I'm going to delete it or hit the Enter key either way to remove the text. And now I'm going to do pretty much as I did last time. That was Insert, Insert Object. Insert object that I'm creating from a file. I'm going to go browse for it. It seems to remember that I had been in the new for jazz folder. And this one, instead of being an MP3 sound file, it's an MP4 video file named Big Band. So I'm double clicking on that. I'm choosing OK. Again, I see a little icon with the name of the file. And the way I'll play it will be to double click on it. So I'm going to stop zooming in. I'm going to double click on it. Here comes the video file. It says, are you sure you want to open this? Yes, I am sure. It's going to open up in my Windows Media Player. bunch of swinging cats, baby. All right, I'm closing my Windows Media Player, and you're about to catch up with me. If you would like to see that video on your own, maybe just check to make sure it works, even if you're not a jazz fan. So basically, we did the same thing. We got rid of the text. We inserted object from a file. We browsed to the location of that folder. And we inserted Big Band MP4 with a double click. Once it's in there, you point at it and double click on it to see it and hear it play. 
So catch up with me there, everybody. So that was inserting audio video from a file that I already had. But starting in Microsoft Word 2013 and now carried over into 2016, you can actually insert online video. Earlier we saw online pictures. This time I want to insert online video. And right now it seems to be grayed out. We'll take care of that when the time comes in our next session. So this is the end of our session about inserting uh, multimedia from files that you already have on your hard drive. So come on back and we'll talk about how can I insert video maybe from YouTube or the Bing Videos website. That'll be our next subject of discussion. So if you got time, we'll see you in a few minutes here. All right, one and all, I got one more trick up my sleeve about multimedia. This is going to bring in video from a website. But I need to have an internet connection not only when I'm putting in the video, but later on um, when I'm uh, presenting my Word document, I have to have a connection to the internet as well. Uh, the good news is that it's an internet connection, so whoever I send this thing to, as long as they have a good browser, then they ought to be able to hear this, uh, this audio, or in this case, see the video. So there's a relatively famous trumpet player who's no longer with us named Dizzy Gillespie, very often referred to as the godfather of the bebop era. Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, a pianist named Art Tatum are generally created. Dizzy Gillespie, trumpeter, Charlie Parker, um, alto saxophone player, pianist Art Tatum are largely credited with creating the sound of bebop jazz. And so I would like to play a video of Dizzy Gillespie playing in a big band, and we're going to grab it from the internet. Now, when I was inserting an online picture, I only needed the internet to put the picture in, not when somebody looks at the document later. But in this case, I not only need an internet connection when I put the video in, but somebody who's going to play that needs to have an internet connection when they play it. So here we go. Let's see how that happens. So I'm going to click just to the right of my little icon, and I would like to insert a page break. So I'm going to go up here to the Insert tab. We've got the Pages pull-down list, and I can insert a page break. By the way, I'm not sure that I mentioned this earlier, Control and the Enter key is another way to insert a page break. Yes, I think I did um, mention that earlier. So I'm going to insert a page break right here. Starts a brand new page. And then down here, this is where I'm going to insert my online video. In fact, I see a button for it, Insert Online Video, but it seems to be grayed out. And the reason it's grayed out is that I am starting with a document that was created in a version of Word that was earlier than 2007. It says Compatibility Mode, and when you're working in Compatibility Mode, you cannot insert an online video. So what can I do about that? Well, I'm going to take this document and convert it into the latest version of Word document. I'm going to do that under the File tab, and there's a choice right here that says Convert. And if I zoom in on that, it says right now some features are being disabled to prevent problems with working with people who use previous versions of Office. The word Convert wouldn't even be here if I didn't see the words Compatibility Mode up at the top. That choice just wouldn't even show up. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go click on Convert. I get this little message says your document will be upgraded to the newest file format. While you're getting used to all the new features of Word, it may make minor layout changes. You usually don't see too much of that. Converting allows you to use all the new features of Word. Sounds great so far. And then I'm noticing this last sentence. This document will be replaced by the converted version. And there's no undo for this. So I'm going to be brave. I'm going to say, yeah, I don't need that old version anymore. I want to upgrade to the newer version. I'm going to click on the okie dokie button. And as I look closely up at the top, it no longer says compatibility mode. And as I look at the online video button, it is now selectable. So why don't you take just a moment and do that much. You're going to go over to your file tab. You're going to click on the convert button. See how it has disappeared now that I've converted it. So you'll click on Convert, and then you'll choose OK, and it won't say Compatibility Mode anymore, and the online video button will be available. So put the video on pause and do that, please. 
All right, now comes the process of actually inserting the video. And this video is going to come from YouTube. So I'm going to click on online video. Dialog window appears, giving me a couple of choices about where I can get my video from. I can get it from a Bing video search, or I can actually go to YouTube and search for something. And in this case, I'm going to use the YouTube version of it. I'll type this in and then I'll magnify it. So it's going to involve this trumpeter, Dizzy Gillespie, and a very good friend of his, J.C. Hurd, who is a drummer. Now, again, I don't know how many of you are jazz fans, but any of you who have ever seen a big picture of a whole bunch of jazz players uh, referred to as a great day in Harlem. They even made a video about it. Um, here's the story behind it. Um, a photographer from Vogue magazine named Art Kane uh, was hired to do a little uh, photographic piece on jazz players. This was in 1959. And so he sent out the word that he wanted all these jazz players to get all dressed up and meet him out in front of a particular brownstone in Harlem, and they were going to take a picture. In fact, you know, he shot several pictures of it, but one of them is the one that was eventually published in Vogue magazine. Now imagine, you got all these jazz players who have been playing late at night on Friday, and then he wants them to all get up and get all gussied up and dressed up and hop the train or the bus or whatever and head over to this brownstone and, uh, and pose for this picture. Now, uh, that picture is not in the public domain, so I can't actually pull that picture up right now. But if you were to go to Bing, for example, and search for the phrase, A Great Day in Harlem, you would be able to see that picture. And the reason I mention it is at the far right of that picture, you would see Dizzy Gillespie with his arm around the shoulder of this drummer named J.C. Hurd. All right, having said that, we're now going to fast forward to... Let's see, this would have been about 1983, so roughly 35 or 40 years since that 1959 picture was taken. Um, so here we go. I'm going to click on the search magnifying glass over here to go to YouTube and pull up videos of Dizzy Gillespie and J.C. Hurd. And then I'm going to either click and then insert, or a nice faster way, double click, on this first video right up in the upper left corner, I'm double clicking on that. And here comes a little video player. So catch up with me. Um, we're doing insert online video. I did have to do something before I was able to do that. I had to convert my compatibility mode file to the newest format. I think you already did that. And so you click on online video and again, let me spell out the name for everybody, and I'll magnify it on screen here. And then in the search YouTube, it was Dizzy Gillespie and JC Heard. And let me use my third-party zooming in software to magnify that on our screen. Dizzy Gillespie and JC Heard. So you type that in, and then you click on the little magnifying glass. It will present you with a list of several um, such videos, and you will double-click on the one in the upper left-hand corner, and that will get you right here. Have at it, everybody. Put the video on pause. Catch up with me inserting this online video. All right, one and all, to play it, I'm going to hover over it, and it's a little hard to read, but at the right-hand side it says, Control-click to follow the link. Now, I can actually get away with just clicking on the little icon. I don't have to Control-click. So it'll take it a second to load, and here it comes. And so now I'm going to click the play button right here, and we'll be able to see it and hear it. J.C. Heard Orchestra and Dizzy Gillespie. So here we are. Look at his cheeks bulging out. Notice that his trumpet has a permanent bend in it on purpose. Now the reason I know about this video is that this is me playing right there. 
So this would have been 1983 or thereabouts. And um, yes, I was playing in a big band where Dizzy Gillespie was, uh, was a featured artist. Uh, but my favorite part of the video is that I still had hair. I, I don't have so much hair anymore. So it wasn't that I played with Dizzy's like big band all the time. It was just that I played in J.C. Hurd's big band. And every time Dizzy came to the Detroit area, we would always be the big band that played with him. So I got to play with Dizzy four or five different times. So um, more information than you need to know, but let's me show off a little bit. So uh, that's the deal. So I'm now tapping the escape key and it drops me back in here. So catch up with me there. Put the video on pause. You're in, including the online video. You type in Dizzy Gillespie, JC Heard. You probably did all that already. You clicked on it, you got the video. And then if you want to play it, go ahead and uh, click on the play button. It'll magnify it. You click the play button again and you're good to go. So catch up with me. All right, to give you a little brain break, I would like to tell you one of my favorite jazz stories here. So I'm going to click on this thing and I'm going to start it playing. And I'm just going to fast forward a little bit so you can see part of the band there. Let it play for just a second here. There we go. So, so I'd like to tell you a little story about this guy back here. His name was Marcus Belgrave. And we lost Marcus about six months ago now. Um, but he told me uh, I, what I think is the greatest jazz story in the world. So Marcus was playing with the original Ray Charles big band, Blind Ray Charles, Gospel, Rock, Jazz, Ray Charles. And so this was in about 1961, uh, Jim Crow era. They didn't have a bus. They would car caravan, sometimes had trouble finding hotels and all that kind of stuff that they had to go through. But he told me a great story about playing a job one night, and here's what a jazz player would say, playing a gig one night in California, and they were going to be playing the next night in Las Vegas. So they've packed up the show in California, now they're all in the car caravan, and they're driving this highway through Nevada, and they've been on it before, they know it's a straightaway for about 40 miles or so. And it's about 4 o'clock in the morning, so there's no traffic. So Ray Charles says, let me drive. Y yeah, blind Ray Charles is driving on this highway with Marcus in the front seat with him. Now, I can't imagine being in the front seat with a blind guy driving, but Marcus swears it's true, and he was a straight-up guy, so I believe him. And he said, so, and this is what Marcus says, so I'm in the front seat with Ray Charles, and I'm saying things like, a little left, Ray, a little right, Ray, gravel, gravel sounds, left, Ray, left, left, you know, trying to get him back on the road. I can't imagine being in the front seat with a blind guy driving, even if it's Ray Charles. But, again, more information than you need to know. You get to learn all kinds of things in my lessons. I'm just entertaining myself. I, ho I hope that you're having some fun here as well. All right, so that's the end of my, end of my story about Marcus. And I'm going to um, tap the escape key to hide that video. And then take a moment and use your save as command to save this file into your finished documents folder. I'm going to change its name from jazz start to jazz finished or something like that. So uh, that's what I'll be doing. Um, right now. You don't have to watch me do that. So we're going to take a little break right now, and when we come back, we're going to start talking about inserting special symbols, maybe mathematical equations, and then after that we'll finish up talking about mail merge, also called form letters. So that's what's on the agenda for the next little bit. Um, for the moment, I'm going to close this session. So if you got time, come on back and check us out for the writing of equations and mathematical symbols, which will be our next subject, everybody. Our next subject of discussion, I have to admit, is pretty specialized. It involves inserting in equations, mathematical equations. So I'm going to click to put my insertion point in there, and under the Insert tab, I see a choice over here called Equation. And just hovering over it to read the explanation um, involves a couple of equations there. I'm going to click on the list arrow, and it starts showing me a list of fairly famous equations. If you were a math geek, man, you would be uh, you would just be a happy camper right now. Area of a circle equation. So I see the Pythagorean theorem for calculating sides of a right triangle. 
I see the quadratic formula for solving for roots of a polynomial equation. Now, I'm actually kind of digging up some dead brain cells just talking about it here. Trigonometric functions, sines and cosines, Greek symbols, uh, alpha, beta, epsilons, gammas, you know, all your, all your favorite Greek symbols that about the only time you ever see them is at a fraternity or a sorority looking on the outside of the building there. So anyway, uh, and there's also more equations from office.com, should you not see just the right one, and you can build your own from scratch, but I'm going to start with one that exists already here, and uh, we'll see that we're going to get a whole ribbon up here of mathematical symbols. So I'm kind of flipping a coin. I'm going to go up here to the uh, quadratic formula, and when I click on it, here is a copy of the quadratic formula right there. I'm zooming in on it. So please do that with me. Uh, go to the Insert tab, click on the pull-down arrow for the formulas, and choose the quadratic equation, quadratic formula, please. You can feel free to try any of the other ones, but that's the one I'm starting with. So catch up with me. All right, now I'm noticing that I now have a whole ribbon of things about formulas and such. Um, so over in this section, for example, I've got like plus, uh, that plus minus, greater than, less than, double greater than, greater than or equal to. There is no key on my keyboard that's going to print out a less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Normally when I'm dividing on a computer, I'm using the slash in a formula. They actually have the old uh, arithmetic divide sign here. Equal to, not equal to, infinity, all kinds of things that a mathematician could make good use of. And so this one student jumped up in the middle of a class and he said, I write technical manuals and very often I have to put in formulas and I always have to struggle to figure out how to get them in there. Very often I wind up like writing them out and then taking a picture of that and then pasting the picture in the document. Now I'm going to be able to just build them right here in Microsoft Word. He was a happy camper. He was a happy geeky camper. All right, so now maybe I start replacing symbols with numbers or other symbols. By the way, it's not going to be able to solve it for me. Wouldn't that be cool? If Word could actually solve this quadratic equation here for me, no, not going to happen. All right, but maybe I have some numbers here. So uh, maybe I'm going to replace the B with um, some kind of uh, trigonometric function. So I see a little button down here about functions. And so I've got uh, derivatives, other kinds of fractions and so forth. Uh, I'm clicking on the pull-down arrow for script, and it's got things about superscript and subscript. Radicals, meaning square root signs. Man, trying to make a square root sign without this particular version of this program, really tough to do. Uh, I see one here about function. This is about trigonometric functions, sines and cosines. So maybe I need that. Maybe I need to uh, uh, put in a uh, cosine here. And it's going to be the cosine of... Oh, how about the Greek letter pi? So now i got to try to figure out where to find a Greek letter pi. Well, chances are it's going to be over here in these extra symbols. I'm going to click the uh, third arrow in the gallery, and now I'm in there looking for the pi symbol. And here it is right here. And I'm going to click on that. So third arrow. And give me that pi symbol. Drops it right in the little placeholder there. Okay, so I was able to insert a trigonometric function, able to insert some Greek symbols here, and assuming that they know what all those things mean, I can build my formulas that way. So I can drag across something in here and replace it with some sort of fraction, for example. And so maybe it's going to be 2 raised to the third power divided by... 7, or whatever the case may be. So if you want to get in there and play a little bit with that, feel free to do that. If it's something that doesn't interest you at all, and you're thinking, I'm never going to use that, then that's totally up to you, but you ought to get in and try it a little bit. And, you know, even though you're not a necessarily a great mathematician, well, you might find things that are useful for this. And if you are a mathematician, like if you're taking a, um, you know, you're taking an algebra class or a a trigonometric class or a calculus class, then you will have all the symbols that you need for making those kind of formulas. So put the video on pause, play with that a little bit. I'm going to make this the end of the session about equations.
when you come back, if you got time to come back right away, we're going to start talking about form letters, also referred to as mail merge. So this is Dan McAllister signing off from the equations right now. Welcome back to Word 2016. New subject, form letters, officially named mail merge in Microsoft Word. And it's used for several different things that we're going to talk about. So maybe I have a list of patients at my doctor's office and I'm keeping track of their names and the date of their last visit and what their complaint was on the last visit and what the doctor prescribed as their treatment and the balance due and things like that. And then I would send out a billing letter that has certain text that I want everybody to see on their form letter, sometimes referred to as the boilerplate text. And in that boilerplate text, I'll leave little gaps where I'm going to fill in their name or their complaint or the doctor's prescription or the fee and so forth. So I need two parts to this. The file called the primary file is the boilerplate text, and the secondary file is sometimes referred to as the data source. And they can be created in either order. I usually think about this as having a data source first and then creating a form letter where I use pieces of the data from the data source. So that's how I'm going to start building mine. And we're not going to build the whole thing. I've already got some practice files set up for it. But let's see what the process could look like to start creating them from scratch. And then we'll kind of jump into a place where we got part of it done already. So here we go. We will just start with a blank document here. So maybe this is going to be my list of patients. And I need to keep track of certain things about them. This could be done in a table. So I'm going to insert a table. Let's see, maybe I'll make it a couple of rows tall and six or seven columns wide. I can always add to it or remove them later. We've talked about that. So I'm going to start with a table. Let's see, I just made it two by three, four, five, six, seven, it looks like. And then inside there, I want to have their last name, their first name. Let's see, date of last visit. What was their complaint? What was the recommendation? And maybe the most important part, the balance due. If I don't think of anything to do with that last column, I can take it out later. Let's see, so for my first patient, let's see, last name is Washington. First name, George. Date of visit, let's see, July 4th, 1776. He is actually our oldest customer here, literally. His complaint, sore gums. Now, as I type that in, I typed it with a capital letter, but if this goes in the middle of a sentence, it's going to look kind of funny with a capital letter there. So I'll put it in there in lowercase letter, and then I'll move on to the next cell. Now, there is one thing that sometimes happens when I'm talking about this. Let me go back and just start that again. So I'm going to retype Sir Gums, and I'm going to type it in lowercase letter. Sir Gums. And then when I hit the right arrow key or the tab key, notice I didn't even get that far. It capitalized the first letter of that cell. Which begs the question, how can I get it to not do that? Well, a little side note here. One of the ways to get it to not do that has to do with the auto text. Um, we were talking about auto things a little bit earlier in a previous lesson. So let me go to the file tab. I'm going to go down here to options. And in the proofing section, we had talked about autocorrect options earlier. And I'm going to go up here and click on autocorrect options. And then one of the things I notice up here at the top is it will automatically capitalize the first letter of table cells. So that's why I got that capital S in there. If I put that in the middle of a sentence, it's going to look really funky with that capital S. So this would be a way to turn that off. Just uncheck that. And that way, when you're typing stuff in those cells, then they won't automatically have capital letters. Okay, for our purposes, I'm not going to worry about that too much. But just thought I would tip you off to that. So I'm going to cancel a lot of that part. So, so far, I'll just let that be capitalized. 
So, George Washington showed up with the sore gums. Doctor took a look at it and said, you need to file, and again, I'll make it with a lowercase letter, file. In fact, if I go do what I said I was going to do, file and options and proofing and autocorrect options and tell it, don't capitalize the first letter of those table cells. That'll be a better demonstration for what I'm saying here. So uh, the doctor says, you got sore gums, George. You really should file your wooden teeth. Uh, by the way, George, that'll be uh, $400. Yeah, it looks like I don't really need this last column, so I'm going to click at the top of it, and I can either hit the backspace key or probably a better way that would be easier to remember. I'm going to go up to the uh, layout part of my table tools, and what I want to do now is uh, delete those two cells that I've just selected. Are you sure you want to delete them? Yeah, delete those cells. What do you want to do with the other stuff that's there? Well, shift things upward from there. Or shift things to the left. There isn't really anything to shift to the left, but I'll go with that, and it removes that from my table. All right, so I'm not going to make you do that, because I'm not actually going to use this in a mail merge, but this is how I could set up the, um, the data source. Have a list of patients. Uh, notice that I've separated first name from last name so that we can sort by the last name. And then whatever sort of information that you're keeping track of. Now, right now, I seem to be making this specifically for a mail merge, but maybe this is something that I'm keeping track of already. If I'm working for a doctor's office, maybe I've already got a list of the patients and this kind of information. Now, I can either do that in Word and then use it in a mail merge, or I could actually have this list of people or products or whatever it is I'm using in my mail merge in a um, Excel spreadsheet or in a Microsoft Access table. We'll see those options in a few minutes when we actually get into the part about putting the two pieces together. So I'm not going to make you start doing that. I just wanted you to see the process of creating the first part of it, at least what I consider the first part of it, the data source. And so I'm going to end this session right there. I'm going to try to keep them short here for a minute. So that's how I might go about creating a data source. You are not required to do that. I just wanted you to see it. So I would normally save that thing. Maybe I'll do that right now. I use my save command. I'm going to call it um, patients list, and I'm going to store it in my finished documents folder. If you want to try that, feel free to do it, but I'm not really going to use that one in a mail merge, as it turns out, so it won't help you all that much. So I'm going to end this session, and when I come back, we'll start talking about the primary file, which would be the, uh, the boilerplate text. So there's just my quick example of a data source. Now let me give you a quick example of the boilerplate text, would be in a separate document here. So I'm going to start a brand new document. Now if I go with File and New, I see all the templates. What keyboard shortcut could I have used to make a new blank document without seeing the templates? Hopefully you are saying, Dan, can't you remember anything? That would be Control and the letter N. Well, too late for that right now. I'm just going to say, give me a blank document. And so maybe this is going to be the uh, boilerplate text for the document that could go with that list of patients. You know, we could have today's date in there. Keyboard shortcut for inserting a date in Microsoft Word, Alt, Shift, and D. What's in today's date? All right, I'm hitting the Enter key. And then as far as the boilerplate text, maybe I'm going to say, Dear, and then leave a little space for the first name. And then I'll put in a comma. And I'll hit the Enter key. When you visited us on, and then leave a little space here, and this would be where I would put in the date of visit, comma. You complained of, leave a little space. By the way, one of the most common mistakes is forgetting to leave the little space, and then have the next word just plugged right up against the word, you know, the word of. Turns out it's not too hard to fix, but it's a common mistake. So this would be where I would put in the complaint and then a period at the end of that sentence. Maybe I hit the enter key and start a new uh, sentence here. The doctor suggested that you, and then right in here would be where the doctor's suggestion could go in. And then I could have another line that's about your balance and when it's due and things like that. So you get the general idea. These are the words that would appear on everybody's letter. And then they would have a little place waiting here where I want to put in the first name and the date of visit and the complaint and the suggested, uh, you know, uh, treatment. 
So that would be the two parts of that kind of a form letter. Uh, so the primary, the one called the primary letter is actually the boilerplate text. The one called the secondary file is the data source, the list of people that I'm going to be sending this to. Okay, so again, you don't need to necessarily create that unless you want to, and you can feel free to play with it. But I'm actually going to start with two documents that have more information in them than this. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop and save this as a doctor form letter. Uh, but again, you don't really have to create that unless you want to. So I'm going to end this little session. And when we come back, we'll be using two other documents and we'll actually go through the process of putting them together. Hey all, welcome back. It's time to start seeing how to put together a form letter once you have the primary file and the secondary file. And again, I won't be using those particular ones that I had put together earlier. That's why you didn't necessarily have to create them. So um, first thing I want to do is take a look at the list of uh, my clients that I'm going to be sending out my letter to. And in this case, it's stored in an Excel file. So I'm going to go down, and again, you won't be able to see me do it because it's slightly off the bottom of my screen, but I'm going to go start a copy of Excel 2016, and I'm going to use it to open uh, one of our practice files here. So open a workbook, navigate, going to go browse to my Word sample files folder. And you can see its name is Client Data. And I'm going to double-click to open that. I would like you to do that too. So take just a moment, go start Excel, and then tell it to open the client data file. When it comes up, it should look like this. So take a moment and join me there. Open up Excel, not Word for this, and then use Excel to open the file name client data. All right, now that you have that open, uh, there's a thing that I see here that I would like to fix. These are not my employees, these are my clients, so it's not really appropriate to have the hire date. Um, so this is going to be about bank accounts. So maybe we'll have it say the opening date, you know, when their, when their uh, account was opened. So I'm clicking right here on cell I1, hire date, and then maybe up in the formula bar you can replace the word hire with opening date. And then hit the enter key so that becomes the name at the top of that column. And then I'm going to double click on the edge of column I and just widen it a little bit. That part's not required. But do change it from hire date to opening date, please. Take a moment and do that. Put the video on pause and just change that part. And then click the save button to save this file. This time I'm not worried about save as. Because I do want to fix the original. And if you go back and try to use it again later, I want it to say opening date. So change that to opening date and then actually click the save button and save that right in its original spot, please. So put the video on pause, change that one thing, and then save it, please. All right, assuming you've had a chance to do that, uh, now I wanna go look at the boilerplate text for this. And I don't actually have to have the Excel data source open in order to use it. So feel free to close Microsoft Excel. And then back in Word, Let's open the boilerplate uh, text for this file. So going up to the File tab, I'm going to go Browse for a file, and we're looking for one named Mail Merge Source. So I'm heading to my uh, practice files here, and scrolling down to get to the M's. It's called Mail Merge Account Balance Notice, please. So double click to open that one, mail merge account balance notice. And here's our boilerplate text. So take a moment and catch up with me there. Put the video on pause, go open the file in Word this time, mail merge account balance notice. All right, you can see we've used this document for a while teaching around our company. So instead of having it say, here's your statement for the month of, why don't we make it say, here is your statement as of, and then we'll put in today's date right there. So here is your statement as of, and leave a little space. And then you could go to the insert tab, and uh, over here there's a little button, kind of looks like a mini calendar, and it says insert date and time. And I'm going to click on that, and it gives me different ways to insert uh, the date. You may also remember I mentioned a keyboard shortcut earlier that was Alt, Shift, and D. 
And when you use that keyboard shortcut, you always get the short date here. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to put in uh, the short date. Also, I'm going to let it update automatically just in case I get around to printing this thing out tomorrow and I don't have a chance to do it today. So I'll be able to say as of whatever date I'm actually sending this thing out. So we'll leave it as update automatically and click OK. And so there it is. Here's your statement as of whatever the date is that you're taking this lesson. So take a moment and do that. So now we're going to put in the placeholders that will hold people's names that we're sending this to. And we'll fill out a thing that says, all right, here's what your balance is on this date and so forth. So first thing I'd like to do is let's click to put our cursor right in front of here is and maybe hit the enter key about three times, please. Enter, enter, enter. And then I'm going to move back up to the beginning or I could use control home to get to the beginning. But one way or another, move your cursor back up to the top of that thing. So let's see a way that we can put in um, a place for their name and their address, for example. First name, space, last name, enter key, address. So that's what I'm about to do right now. Uh, and this is going to be found under the mailings ribbon. The mailings command tab produces the mailings ribbon. So come on up and we'll click on mailings. And there are several buttons. I can just use buttons if I wish. Some of them are grayed out because we're not really into the process very much yet. I really like something called the Mail Merge Wizard. So I'm going to go over here and click on Start Mail Merge. And then on the pull-down list that appears, there's a choice called Single Step-by-Step -step Mail Merge Wizard. And this thing's been around for a long time, and it works really well, in my opinion. So I'm going to start the Step-by-Step -step Mail Merge Wizard, which opens up a little task pane over at the right-hand side. So please do what you just saw me do. I hit Enter about three times. I put the cursor back up at the beginning of the document. I went to the mailings ribbon and I've clicked on start mail merge, step-by-step -step mail merge wizard, and that's how I got this little thing going on over at the right-hand side. So come join me, put that video on pause, and start up that mail merge wizard. Now that we have the mail merge wizard open, let's use it to build our form letter. So again, I'm clicking to put my cursor right up here at the beginning, and over here at the right-hand side in my mail merge task panel, I can see I am in the middle. So I have put my cursor up in the upper left hand corner and over at the right hand side I can see the mail merge wizard has opened. And apparently it's got six steps to it and I'm on step one right now. And in step one you can see, if I zoom in a little bit over here, you can see that we could create several different kinds of things. Letters, email blasts, printing out envelopes, printing out labels. A directory is really just a list in one form or another. And every time I click on one of these radio buttons at the top, like email messages, then the middle of this wizard changes to say, well, here's what this would be about. So for our purposes right now, I would like to leave it as letters. And then let us click on Next, Starting Document. You are now in step two of six. So take just a minute and do that on your screen, everybody. You can put the video on pause if that's helpful. All right, now in step two of six, it's got another little section of questions here. How do you want to set up your letters? Do you want to use this current document? Do you have a template that you've used in the past? Have you got an existing document that you've used in the past for this? Well, I want to use this current document. I mean, I do have a document that I've used for this in the past, and, and this is it. So I'm going to use this current document that I have open. Gee, that was a pretty easy step. Let's click on Next, Select Recipients, it says down here. All right, now in the new window, it says, all right, are you going to stop right now and type in a list? Are you going to select a list of your Outlook contacts? Or are you going to use an existing list that exists in a file already? Well, we're going to use an existing list, which means our next step is to browse to the location of that list. So it says, use names and addresses from a file or database. And I mentioned in passing earlier, this could be a Word table, it could be an Excel spreadsheet, it could be a Microsoft Access table. So I'm going to click on Browse, and now I have to navigate to the location of my uh, secondary file, also called Data Source. Well, let's see, it is in my Word sample files. 
That's the one we saw moments ago, the client data. And I'm double clicking on that. And it says inside there, there's a uh, named range called personal data, and that's actually the one that I want. So I'm clicking on OK. And then it actually gives me a list of the data that's in that Excel file. As I scroll left and right, I can see that data. It doesn't have dollar signs in the balance. That was formatting in Excel. But I've got the dates, I've got the account numbers and so forth, phone numbers, contact information. Data source is just the name of the file here. And then if for some reason there's somebody that I don't want to send my form letter to, I could uncheck them here. In my case, I do want to send it to everybody, so I'm just going to leave them all checkmarked. I also see a thing here about sorting the list. So I could sort it by last name. I could sort it by their opening day here, their opening date of their account. So I'm just kind of flipping a coin. Maybe I'll tell it I want to sort it by the opening date. So I'm going to click on the sort button. And it says, what would you like to sort by? And when I click the pull down arrow, here are the um, column headings. And I said I was going to sort it by the opening date. So I'll do that. Sort by opening date. Uh, maybe we'll do it in ascending order so that my oldest customers are at the top of the list right now. So I'm clicking on OK. Then if I scroll to the right, I can see that it has sorted it that way my oldest customers, the customers that I've had the longest, not necessarily their age, but the customers that I've had the longest happen to be at the top of the list right now because of the way I sorted that. I could also filter it. I could say, I only want to send this out to the people from New York, but not from New Jersey. I'm not going to do that right now, but you can see these are choices that are available down here. So I just told it to sort by, um, by the opening date in ascending order, and I'm going to click on OK. So take a moment and do that. Again, it's over here about the recipient list. You click on the little button for that. You're going to go point it towards that Excel file. You'll choose OK. You'll see the data. And then maybe tell it to sort by the opening date. Put the video on pause. Catch up with me. All right, welcome back. So I see the next step is to actually write the letter. So I'm going to go down and click on that. Down here where it says step three of six, you're in that right now. You're about to go to step four of six, writing the letter. Also notice if you've messed something up, there is a button here to go back to previous, which would take me to step two, the starting document. But things are going well for me. I hope they're going well for you. In which case, I'm going to go click on next, write your letter. And that opens up a little thing going on in the top part of this uh, right-hand panel. So go ahead and click on that, write your letter, and then you should see the same thing that I'm seeing here. All right, so I've got several things going on over here. An address block, a greeting, things like um, dear Mr. or Mrs. or to whom it may concern, things like that. More items is one way to get to my list of available fields. When I say fields, I mean columns, like first name, last name, that kind of stuff. So um, maybe up here at the top, I would like to put together an address block. So it doesn't mean I'm blocking something. It just means it puts several things together all at once. So when I click on address block, notice what I get here. Their name, their street address, and all that kind of information. By the way, this is going to come in real handy later on when we start doing labels, mailing labels, to not have to put these things in here one at a time, but to have it just automatically calculate it from the columns that I already have. So maybe that's what I would like in the upper left-hand corner here, this uh, address block. And then I'm going to click on OK. And notice it didn't, I don't actually see their name and address. It's got a little placeholder where the address block will go. So it's your turn to do that. Down there at the bottom, I think you've already clicked on Next to go from Step 3 to Step 4. And then do what I just did. Go over here and click on the address block. And then click OK, and you'll see a little placeholder for it. All right, moving on here for the moment. So um, I'm going to see their name, their address. You know, we saw what that looked like. And uh, so it's got, here is your statement as of this particular date. Um, maybe I'll just click here and remove uh, at least one of those extra spaces there. 
So here is your statement as of. Feel free to call us if you've got any questions. And then maybe down below, we're going to put in information about their name and their date and their balance. So here we go. We'll move down below the part about Bank of San Francisco. Maybe click right at the end of that, hit the enter key a couple of times. In fact, maybe what we would do is start a whole new page and put the statement on there. So how could I put in a new page? How could I quickly jump to the beginning of the next page without hitting the enter key about 20 times? How about if I inserted a page break? And maybe I even remember that the keyboard shortcut for inserting the page break is control and the enter key. And I'm going to do that right now and it jumps down and starts a new page. So take a moment and do that. Click right at the end of the text that's in our boilerplate text so far. Control enter to insert a page break. Yes, you could go to the insert tab and do it, but I'd like to stay here in the mailings tab. So I'm using keyboard shortcuts. All right, so we've got our address block. And we are in the process of writing our letter. So let's see, we've already got their name in there. We've already got their street address. So maybe we would want to say uh, opening date and a colon and a space. And then I'd like to put in a placeholder to specifically hold the information from that column called opening date. Now, an old school way to do it is to go over here and click on more items and see a list of all the field names. But since that initial way of doing it, they have added some buttons up here that will do several, um, several buttons that will do similar things. And I prefer to actually use this part up here where it says insert merge field. So I'm going to click on insert merge field. Here's the same list. Here's the difference between these two. If I go with more items, and right here I want to insert a placeholder for the real opening date, I click on that, I click insert, it puts in the placeholder, and this list stays open. And I can't really type anything down here until I then close the list. So feel free to do that one that way, and then I'll show you why I like the other way. So you're going to click on the more items, and you're going to click on opening date, and then click insert or double click on opening date is a nice easy way. And then you're going to have to close this window. So pause the video and do that much. All right, so now I'm closing that window. Notice the difference between the text here and the brackets over here. This information will actually be replaced with their opening date. These are words that will appear. In fact, we're not done with this, but why don't we take a second and see what this is going to look like. For example, up here, I see a little spot says, preview the results. And in fact, I can do that and move from customer to customer to customer. So I'm going to click on Preview Results, and here is the opening date for the first customer on my sorted list. And if I now scroll upwards, here is the actual contact information for that first person on my list. So go do that for a moment. Go up here and click on Preview Results. So instead of seeing placeholders, you will have a chance to see what the actual form letter will look like. Pause the video and do that. All right, welcome back. Just looking at stuff up here, got any ideas about how you might go look at the second person's information? The second person's information? So I'm gonna go click on the right arrow. Here is the second person's information and their balance opening date. Not balance, but account opening date. Right, And then to get the placeholders back and not have things cluttered up with the actual words, just turn off the preview results button so you see the placeholders. And then scroll on back down here and we'll continue with our form letter. Pause the video, take a peek at the information, hide the preview results, and then come on back down here, everybody. All right, we're getting pretty close to putting this thing together and moving on. So I'm hitting the Enter key and we've got there opening date in there. Now maybe we'd like to put in their current balance. Uh, and we've already told them it's as of this particular date. So let's put in labels, current balance, colon and a space. By the way, um, I said that a common mistake is to forget to put in the space. Let's see what we would do if we had made that mistake. 
And this time I'm not going to use the more items where I have to remember to close the list after I'm done putting it in so that I can type. Uh, I said I have this preferred method nowadays where I go with insert merge field. So what field should go in here? Uh, yeah, it's pretty obvious. It should be the balance. So I click on balance and it tucks it right in there next to the words current balance. Right next to it. I didn't leave a space. So take a moment and do that. Instead of going with mo items, we'll go with insert merge field and put in a placeholder for the balance. And that way the list disappears when you have clicked on it. All right, so let's see the, uh, the results so far. We'll go up and preview the results again. Current balance 55, and it's like right next to it. I need a space in there. In fact, maybe I'd like a dollar sign in there. So here's what I'm about to do. I want to put my cursor right after the colon and before the 55. I click, but it's kind of hard to tell that I've got a cursor there. It's pretty subtle. It's flashing, but it also looks like it has selected the 55. Turns out that's actually a lie. If it had selected the 55, it would look like this. So it doesn't exactly look like that when I click to put my cursor here. And the reason that's important is if I hit the space bar, it does not replace the 55. And in fact, if I'd like a dollar sign to appear there, this is my chance to type a dollar sign right there. So that looked like it was gonna be awful but it turns out it's not so awful. So hopefully you made that mistake with me, you kind of purposely forgot to put in the space, and then you just saw how to fix it. You click to put the cursor, it's kind of hard to see, but it's there. Click to put the cursor between the colon and the 55, hit the space bar, type a dollar sign, and catch up with me. All right, I'm gonna hide the preview results so I just see the placeholder. And then maybe we'll put a little greeting under there. We thank you for your business. And then let's use a save as command to save this file into our finished documents folder. All right, everybody, we did the uh, mail merge for the uh, uh, form letter. Now I wanna do a mail merge for putting together the labels. So maybe we'll start with a blank document here again. And let's go to our mailings ribbon one more time. And we're going to start the mail merge, and we're going to use that mail merge wizard. Start the mail merge. Step-by-step -step mail merge wizard. Catch up with me. Pause the video. Start that mail merge wizard, please. All right, here we go. This time we're not doing letters. We're doing labels. So I'm going to go to the radio button for the labels. And I'm going to click Next. Come join me, choose labels, click next. Here you are in step two. So I think we'll go with the uh, suggestion here to change the document layout. And then down here in the middle, it says, all right, you can set up your label options. So I'm gonna click on that as well. Label options. And this is going to take me to a window that we saw in an earlier lesson where when we were looking at the size of labels and all that kind of stuff and we had a little discussion about Avery labels. So I'm going to let it catch up with me. You do the same thing. Go click on label options, please. And in my case, it remembers my previous settings about labels when I was making a whole bunch of the same label that I was using labels that come on a piece of paper that's U.S. letter size and the brand name of Avery. And then in the Avery labels, we discovered 5160 number was a pretty good one for uh, putting together mailing labels. So right now it's ready to start at 00 something or other for the uh, product number. I'm going to type a 5. Excuse me, first of all, I'm going to get out of the part that says Avery US letter, and I'm gonna go click on any choice down here in the product numbers, then I'm gonna type a five. And then I don't have to scroll very far to find the one called 5160. It claims it's the Easy Peel address labels, 
They're one inch high, two and three quarters inches wide. They're actually on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And the, there's a total of 30 of them on, a, on one of those sheets. So it's three across and 10 down. And again, I hope I never, ever, ever have to go in and create a new label layout. Man, that would be a lot of hard work. A lot of uh, sort of trial and error. Really nice to be able to choose just by a product number there. And then having chosen Avery US Labels and 5160, go ahead and click on OK. And it has done this thing where it changed the document layout. Now I can actually see placeholders for the sizes of the labels. And as I scroll to the left, there's a cursor flashing there, but that's all that's in the label so far. All right, so catch up with me. Choose the uh, label options for the Avery 5160 and then come on back. All right, down in the bottom right hand corner, we are ready to select our recipients again. So clicking on select recipients. Again, we're going to use an existing list, that Excel file. We're going to go browse for it. And again, we're looking for the file named client data. You may notice down here in the bottom right corner of this dialog window, it's looking for all kinds of different data sources, including Excel and Access and Word tables and several others. If I click on the little pull down list here, man, there's a ton of them. And again, I want to head over to my um, Word sample files and find the one called client data. So again, it shows me that there's a named range in that Excel file. And when I click on, oh, and also it says the first row of data contains column headers. That's going to be a handy thing. So it doesn't think I'm sending out a label to somebody named Mr. First Last. So I'm just going to click on OK. And that's the information that it needs. And then here is the actual list of names again. So most of these steps are very much like they were in the uh, form letter part. We're just doing it now for a label instead of a form letter. So again, I could sort this thing. Now, the post office would appreciate the help of having you sort it by the zip code. In fact, I mentioned it in class one day, and one of my students said, yeah, actually, they appreciate it so much that they'll give you the bulk rate if you let them know ahead of time that you have sorted it by the zip code. So that's worth doing, man, especially if you got a big list of these to send out sort it by the zip code. So that's what I'm about to do. I'm going to click the sort button right here. And then when it offers me the chance to choose what to sort by, I'm going to sort by the zip code. I'll have to scroll down a little bit to find that. There it is called zip. Up to you whether you want it ascending or descending. I'm not sure that the post office has any preference about that. But the fact that you've taken the time to group them by the zip codes will get you the bulk mailing rate if you tell the post office that you're doing that. All right, so there's my list. I'm going to choose OK now. And I see the first label is blank, and then all the other labels say have a little placeholder for next record. All right, so we're going to see what that's all about. But the next thing I want to do is put in their name and their address and the city and the state and all that kind of stuff. And that's going to happen as I go to my next step down here. Let us click brothers and sisters on next arrange your labels, please. And we had one that was going to fill in their name and their address, city, state, zip, and all that. There was something going on over here at the right hand side. Anybody remember which one it was? That's right, it was the address block. If you just said that, then I award you 10 points for Gryffindor or, or Hufflepuff. There is something to be said for Slytherin, and I hope I've got some Harry Potter fans out there. So I'm stepping out of there, and I'm going to go click on Address Block. Now you'll notice over at the left-hand side, there are several ways you could have this address block together. How formal do you want to be? Do you want to include, like, middle initials and that sort of thing? Also, I see a thing down here, only include the country. If it's different than whatever I've set up down here, automatically it's set for United States. 
So while there might be a field for the country, it will leave it out if it's in the U.S. All right, so I'm kind of liking the way that thing's going to look. I'm going to click on the okie dokie button. And it's kind of hard to tell that that has happened on all the records because actually it hasn't yet. Right now I've got an address block in the first label, but then all the rest of them say next record, next record, next record might lead you to believe that that's actually going to show next record, next record. But take a look at my screen. If I go up here and click on preview results, I really only got the first one in there so far. So here's what you need to do. Nice thing about this wizard, it'll actually guide you through it. Right down here towards the bottom, update all your labels. So let's do that. You got the address block in there on the first label. Now scroll down just a little bit. Um, notice there's an up arrow up here or a down arrow down here. And click on update all labels and you'll say now they see, and you'll see that now they say uh, next record address block. And if you go up and click on preview results, you'll see that's looking pretty darn good there right now. So what we'd normally do is, next step, preview your labels. And that way I kind of get to see the whole page of them. And if that's all I need, I could then say next, complete the merge, and it would say print those things out. And again, very often on the printers in the uh, loading tray, they'll have a little picture of how you can put in the envelopes or the uh, labels. But if I'm working on a printer that I'm not familiar with, what I'll do is just grab a piece of paper, make a big X on one side, put it in the printer, and then print out these labels and see did it print on the X side or the other side. And that will help me figure out how I need to put the paper in so I get the labels printed on the correct side. So if that's all I need, I'd be done right there. I could say next, complete the merge, and then I'd click on print. But I like to throw in an extra little thing no extra charge. So I'm going to end the session right here. If that's all you want to see, you're done with the mail merge. If you would like to see how to put in a little picture that would appear on each label, then come on back for the next section. So I'm ending this session right now. If you want to see how to put a little, um, little clip art on uh, each of those labels, then come on back. All right, my diehards, I applaud you who are willing to go the extra mile and come learn how we could add a little symbol, a little online picture to each of our labels here. It's gonna be the same picture. It's not gonna be a different picture for each of the labels, if that's what you're hoping for. Sorry about that. So first thing I wanna do is click to put my insertion point right in front of that very first name there. And it doesn't matter too much whether I have it collapsed or whether I have it expanded. That is whether I'm previewing it or not. Do I want to see the placeholder or the actual data? You can do it either way. I'm going to show the actual data here for the moment. So again, I have clicked to place an insertion point right in front of the K there. It looks like it's selected it all, but it hasn't really. It's just kind of lit it up. So take a moment and do that. Click to place your flashing insertion point right in front of the K in that first, uh, first person's name or whatever letter is in the first person's name there. Pause the video and go do that. So here's where we're going to now insert the online picture. So that was under the insert tab. We're still in the mail merge wizard. That's fine. So I'm going to the insert tab. I'm going to click on online pictures. And then I'm going to go find one of those little cartoonish clip arts that's appropriate for the season. So maybe it's midsummer and 4th of July is coming up and I want to go find a little picture of fireworks. Or maybe it's coming up on Thanksgiving, gobble gobble turkey, as uh, Jim Harbaugh would say. Or maybe it's midwinter and I want to put in a snowman. So that's actually what I'm going to do here. I'm going to put in a uh, clip art image of a snowman. So over here in the Bing image search, I'm going to click on search Bing. And I'm not worried about the copyright issues because I'm just going to go with the cartoonish stuff that they offer me right off the bat. So I'm looking for snowman. Come join me there. That is, click to put your cursor over there, tell it you're going to insert an online picture, and then come with me and type snowman and click the little magnifying glass so that you get a bunch of pictures of snowmen. So come do that much. Video on pause, and then come join me again. All right, so right now you should have little pictures of snowmen, and then you can decide which one you want to use. 
I'm just going to go with door number one here, this basic snowman. I'm going to double click on it and give it a second to catch up with me. And there comes my snowman. And at first my heart skips a little beat because it looks like I've lost all my text. But I haven't. You may remember in earlier examples of putting in pictures, it inserted the picture in line. That means my text is just kicked down a little bit here. You might even be able to see a little snippet of it at the bottom of that label. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm now going to make that uh, picture a bit smaller. You almost have, always have to do that. Now I can actually see, oh yeah, there is text down there. So, um, you know, there is hope. So get your heart started again. And then make that picture a bit smaller so it fits on the label better. And then there's one more thing. I need to wrap the text around that picture in a square layout. So with the picture selected, I have the Picture Tools Format ribbon here where I can wrap text square. Looking good. But it's only that first label. Hopefully I'm not going to have to do that on every one of these labels. That's the good news. You don't have to. Getting it to appear on all the other labels means that we need to find the button that we saw in a couple of steps earlier. I think it was about in step four that said update your labels. That's the one we need to find right now. That'll be the secret to get our new snowman or fireworks or gobble gobble turkey or whatever it is to appear on all of the labels. So most of the time when we go down here to the bottom right corner is to choose next. But right now we're already in step six. We need to back up to the place where we can find the little button that says update your labels. So I click previous, preview your labels, and I don't see the button for updating. You're going to kind of have to go one more previous here. So we'll go previous to step four about arranging the labels. And here's where you will find the magic button to update all your labels to have the snowman. So this is your time. Put the video on pause. You go right down here at the bottom and you hit previous twice and then click on update all labels and it will look like this, ladies and gentlemen. Go for it. Pause the video, update all your labels. All right, welcome back. Now let's go forward to preview all of our labels. That would be, we're in step four of six. Now we're gonna click on to go to step five. Next, preview your labels. Isn't that a wonderful looking thing? So thanks for hanging around and getting the little extra, extra thing there at the end. Notice there's not a way to put a different picture on each label, except to actually go there by hand and click on this one and put in a different one. I am not willing to work that hard. I want Word to do the work for me wherever possible. So all you would do now is click on Next, complete the merge, put the paper in the printer, and then print it. Now, printers don't usually have little markings about how you should put in the labels. They'll very often have little markings about how to put in envelopes, but not really labels. So I developed this little thing that I would do anytime I'm working on a printer that I've not seen before. Just grab a regular piece of paper, make a big X on one side, feed it into the printer, and then pay attention to whether it printed the labels on the X side or the other side. That will help me decide which way I need to actually put in the page of labels into the printer itself. And then you can send it to the printer once you've done that. So thanks for hanging around and picking up the extra little thing there about how to uh, decorate your labels a little bit. Well done, my diehards. So that actually finishes off Module 4. So when you get a chance, come on back and tackle Modules 5 and 6. But for now, this is Dan McAllister signing off at the end of Module 4. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit LearnIt.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing LearnIt.